Hello, everyone. Let's go ahead and call this meeting to order. Ms. Grijalva? Ms. Grijalva? I think there, Ms. Shaw, not everyone has signed on back on yet. Ms. Grijalva? Yes. Okay, I'm doing roll call. Dr. Gavosha? Here. Ms. Luna Rose? Here. Ms. Shaw? Here. Ms. Counts? Here. You're welcome. Okay, so first, Jeffrey's um, land acknowledgements. Student today is Malaya O'Connor. Are you here with us, Malaya? Ms. Shaw, I don't believe Malaya's here. Can we pull up the flag and I can... On behalf of the governing board of the Tucson Unified School District, I, Sadie Shaw, acknowledge that the schools, buildings, and facilities of the Tucson Unified School District reside on the ancestral homeland of the Fa'ana Odom Nation and the federally recognized tribal land of the Pasquayaki tribe. And then next we have our Pledge of Allegiance. Student reading it today is Corbin Wilson. Corbin, are you with us? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Fabulous. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm reading, I'm looking at your bio here. It says that you came to, to Bonillas as a fourth grader. Um, you are extremely kind, well-spoken, and always sets an example of positive behavior and hard work for the other students. In addition, uh, Corbin is always willing to assist with helping others. Corbin's favorite subject in school is math, and this year he is with Miss Wingfield in the fifth grade. He loves that she is always willing to assist him if he is struggling and loves that he gets to read a lot in class. And his favorite part of being a student at Bonillas is singing, seeing all the wonderful people here each day. Thank you so much, Corbin. Go ahead and begin when you're ready um, once you see that flag up on your screen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Have a great school year, Corbin. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, next up is uh, item 2.4, agenda adjustments. Dr. Trujillo? Yes, uh, Governing Board Clerk Shaw, I would like to pull uh, item 6.2. Uh, our candidate is no longer available for hire. So I will be, the administration requests pulling item 6.2. And then uh, superintendent's report. Yes, thank you. Uh, very, very much, uh, Board Clerk Shaw. Welcome uh, TUSD community and uh, members of the governing board. Tonight, the superintendent's report uh, will dive deeper in a more detailed way into the current transportation situation. Uh, I would like to inform the public and the board in a more detailed way of how we arrived at this junction, what happened, if you will, 
what are we doing right now to address the transportation concerns of so many families across the district? And more importantly, what are we gonna do moving forward to see that we are not in this situation again in any of the years to come? So first, taking a look at the storm clouds, if you will, a confluence of events that combine to create a very, very challenging situation uh, that has impacted the district. So first, we have a well-documented shortage, not just here in TUSD, but around the state, around Pima County, and of course, around the country. During the 1920 school year, there were 68 drivers that resigned their positions. Uh, followed by the 2021 school year, we lost another 52 drivers. We quite simply never recovered our full capacity. Now, it is conjecture at this point, we don't have any hard numbers, but there's a lot of anecdotal evidence to suggest that our drivers during the throes of the pandemic, their passion we know is driving students, it's transporting learners. And as many of you know, with no routes to run other than just lunches during our Meals on Wheels program, many of our drivers were reassigned other duties, helping monitors, cleaning school buildings, performing uh, maintenance tasks, and that probably led to a lot of our drivers looking for employment elsewhere. Secondly, we had higher hopes. We were overconfident, uh, overly optimistic that when the governing board approved a new $16 an hour rate, an increase for new drivers coming in, we had visions of a flood of new applicants converging on the district, drivers who had left us, some of the 68 drivers that had left during 1920 would reconsider and come running back to the district. That quite simply didn't happen. Uh, and we were unable to replenish the driver workforce that we were hoping to replenish in the time that we thought that we had. You compound these two storm clouds with a, a dramatic third storm cloud that was brought to our attention at the last minute. Weeks before the opening of school, we were notified by our, con by our contracted transportation service providers largely for exit students that due to driver shortages of their own, they were no longer going to be able to accept the same amount of students that we usually contract them for to provide, in many cases, door-to-door -door transportation services for these students. And because of this last minute notification from our contracted service providers and our own legal obligation to provide IEP mandated transportation services for these identified exit students, we had to pull a lot of routes, a lot of neighborhood routes that normally are in operation to serve our regular general education students. We had to pull them and reallocate them to serve uh, exceptional education students. This was coupled by the refusal to close routes. Um, in our team's passion to maintain the same level of service for all students, our refusal to accept the fact that we would inevitably have to close routes we worked longer and harder and later to try to find a magic solution that quite simply wasn't there. And in doing that and using every single available moment, we went too long, ran late, which led to late communication and last communication, uh, last minute notification and communication to parents. I highlight refusal to close routes in red. This was a factor that was totally under our control this was something that I take responsibility for, and I, I've done so now publicly, and I did um, at the forums, where the previous four variables were external and not under the district administration's control, so to speak. Our refusal to come to terms with our diminished capacity led to some last minute notification that went out to parents that exacerbated the situation as a whole. And something that, as I've said uh, publicly, our intentions were good, hoping against hope, trying to find that last minute solution, but the end result was not and fell short of community expectations for service and for communication. When we take a look at the impact of our contracted service providers, we work with three. We work with Citizen, we work with Handycar, and we work with Comtrans. All of them provide different functions. Citizen was contracted to provide transportation services for 562 students, a capacity that they've routinely handled for us through the last several school years. But this year, due to a driver capacity issue of their own, driver shortage of their own, they were only able to serve 111 
So they were only able to provide drivers and routes for 111 students, leaving our transportation force to deal with an unexpected additional 451 students. Then Handycar came in weeks before the opening of school. And Handycar is our primary service provider that we use for ex-ed students, students with disabilities that have a transportation requirement in their IEP. It's important to note that not all exceptional education students have required transportation services in their IEPs, but a significant portion of them do. And they're not just transportation services that um, are routine in terms of an ex-ed student is just eligible to walk to a bus stop. A lot of these services require door-to-door -door services and they require environments that don't allow for a full capacity bus that may only have to have a route of five or 10 students on them. So Handycar in any given year handles upwards of 300 ex-ed students for us. And this is a capacity they've routinely been able to handle in previous years. This year, uh, they notified us in late July that they would only be able to handle services for 94, leaving an unexpected 206 students with disabilities to be provided by the district. This again required the pulling of drivers that normally serve neighborhood routes on to provide individualized routes for students with disabilities. This was particularly difficult because a neighborhood driver usually will handle a, a full day route that will help them route almost 100 kids a day. Now we're pulling a, a driver that serves 100 neighborhood kids a day into an ex ed situation where their route might only serve five to seven students a day because these students have comprehensive needs and their door to door service and they need uh, point to point transportation. Then we have Comtrans. Comtrans is our most personalized form of transportation. These are um, specifically designed vehicles that transport students with severe, uh, a lot of cases medically fragile, uh, severe cognitive and physical uh, challenges. They require personalized transportation, a lot of times one-on-one, -on -one, meaning they're the only student in the vehicle. And Comtrans notified us that um, previous years, they've been able to serve 30 of our most comprehensive medically fragile students. This year, they've only been able to provide transportation services to 21, leaving an unexpected nine additional students uh, to be routed door to door by our district transportation. So all in all, we have the unexpected uh, provision of uh, almost 700 additional students that pulled valuable neighborhood routes back in uh, to provide these services. The recommitment of almost 20 drivers to serve our ex-ed students that were unable to be covered by Handycar, uh, by Citizen, and of course by Comtrans remo removed vital neighborhood routes and transfer routes away from our neighborhood eligible students and our open enrollment students. Add to that another variable. TUSD this year ran the longest and largest and most comprehensive summer school program in recent memory. This is the first time that the entire transportation infrastructure was fully engaged an entire month longer than it usually is. This is the first time that the entire transportation workforce was working fully the month of June. The drivers, the leadership, the route managers, all of our infrastructure fully engaged and with full services being provided throughout the month of June, critical aspects of new school year planning were simply delayed. New driver orientation sessions delayed, candidate interviews delayed, new bus driver training classes delayed significantly, adding to the storm clouds that uh, I reviewed with you in the previous slides. Add to this that thousands of parents not yet sure of their decisions about the 21-22 school year not yet knowing the full details of the Tucson Unified Virtual Academy, watching Pima County Health Department data about the status of the virus, not being sure if there was gonna be a fourth, a fourth wave, quite simply didn't commit to a transportation decision until later. So quite simply, the demand showed up a lot later than usual. 
confronted with these options later uh, with a shortage of 70 drivers and an increased commitment to serve an additional 700 students due to the limited capacity of our contracted service providers, we were faced with two very, very difficult options. Option one, we of course would keep all of our mandatory individual routes for exceptional education students that have required transportation in their IEPs, and we would continue to provide individual routes for McKinney-Vento students for those of you out there in the viewing public, the McKinney-Vento Act is federal legislation that requires transportation and meal services provided by public schools and districts to students that are classified as homeless. So those McKinney-Vento eligible students under option one would continue to receive their individualized routes. Then under option one, in defense of our USP commitments and promises, and in support of continued immigration, we would only run routes for open enrollment students only, meaning students attending magnet programs, two-way dual language, GATE, OMA, any other USP supported or mandated program, as well as any open enrollment student at the expense of providing no transportation to 2,800 neighborhood eligible students these are students living inside of the attendant zone of their local neighborhood school, however, living more than one and a half miles away from their neighborhood school, thereby needing transportation services. We did not opt for option one due to the disproportionate burden that it would have placed on 2,800 students, the predominant majority of those 2,800 students, meaning students of color and students in lower socioeconomic levels, uh, lower socioeconomic communities throughout the district. We did not support option one. As all of you in the public know, we supported option two. Option two would and does maintain individualized routes for identified ex-ed students, just like option one. It maintains identified individual, individualized routes for identified McKinney-Vento students and keeps their individual routes in play. But for every other student, whether the student is an open enrollment student, a magnet student, a dual language student, or a student that lives beyond one and a half miles uh, of their neighborhood school, everybody now has the opportunity for transportation services through a hub station model. And what these hub station models seek to do, uh, they are established around the district. They are access points for families to drop off their students uh, to receive transportation services to their schools of choice. Whether those schools of choice be their neighborhood schools or their designated magnet or USP programming schools. So this has literally uh, been the most difficult aspect of the decision making. As I mentioned in the opening slide, uh, the administrative team starting with me uh, refusing to accept the reality of having to do either uh, led me to drive my team harder and longer than I've ever had before around transportation. It was very difficult for all of us sitting around the table to admit that we would have to close routes in either option one or option two. And it kept us working Saturday, Sunday, Monday before the start of the school year, trying to find the magic solution that just quite simply wasn't there. And that, of course, led to the last minute communication to parents and families that exacerbated an already difficult situation. But what we're going to do to make sure that we're not in this situation again, we're going to take some better steps around better transparency and communication. We're going to be very, very clear about our commitment to reroute or to restore neighborhood routes. We're going to view this as an opportunity to learn and we're gonna recommit ourselves to service. And one of the more heartbreaking aspects of this entire challenge that was brought to my attention during my parent forum last week, it's not just the last minute communication, it's not just the inconvenience of the hub model, it's the missed opportunity that we had to work with parents and community earlier to try to find a solution mutually. I don't wanna miss that opportunity again. We're gonna be establishing a transportation advisory group 
It's going to consist of parents and site administrators and teachers. They will now be with us every step of the way to assess and analyze and provide feedback on any future changes to transportation infrastructure that impacts routes, arrival times, departure times, and services to students and families. We're also going to be using formal surveys and focus groups to any to the community at large. So even the community that's not going to be serving uh, on our transportation advisory group, we are going to be very, very assertive in putting surveys, getting focus groups, getting public forums going as we rebuild routes, as we recover from this transportation situation. Secondly, we have 25 bus driver applicants currently being processed for hire. Uh, and we're looking at some of our exit routes as some of our exit families opt for a transportation reimbursement through the exit department. We could have some of those drivers coming available again. Uh, and then also taking a look at our hubs. We have some hubs very early in fourth day of school that are very, very lightly utilized right now. Those are also drivers that we can look to being uh, uh, reallocated towards re restoration of neighborhood routes. So through the new bus drivers coming in, through reassignment of uh, drivers that are working exit routes that may not be needed to serve those routes, and of course, looking at um, utilizing some of those drivers that may be available at hubs that aren't as heavily frequented we're gonna have an opportunity to put routes back up uh, with our neighborhood routes. And that's something we wanna do as quickly as possible. The administration, we've asked to engage a nationally renowned transportation consultant group. I've asked that they come in as a neutral third party and that they analyze and assess the effectiveness of our team's navigation of this challenge, that they specifically assess uh, our decision-making at key points through looking at we were 68 drivers down we were at we were down 52 drivers the point in which handy car let us know they wouldn't be able to serve 300 exit students i've asked this consultant group to come in and assess our decision making throughout this difficult situation to offer us feedback on what could have been alternative options for structural changes for communication how we could have handled this better our goal and our commitment is to improve. I haven't engaged this consultant because I want a gotcha on our team. I want our team to learn from this and I wanna share those results publicly with the board and the community so we can commit and memorialize uh, the steps that we need to take to not be in this situation again. And lastly, we formed a 60 person call team of district employees across different departments. They are calling each and every single family affected by this hub model. There are 8,000 families that have opted for transportation, whether they're neighborhood families that live one and a half miles or further beyond uh, their neighborhood school or their open enrollment families. This 60 person call team is calling each and every single family personally to walk them through their options, to help them address challenges, to help get them to the appropriate route and to date, we've called 2,500 of those families out of the 8,000, and it's only day four. Uh, my charge to our team is we're not stopping until we call all 8,000. They deserve a personal phone call, not a robocall, so that they can engage with a live person to see where their, um, what their options are. Now, we have a transportation item <clears throat> later on in this agenda that'll get a little bit more into the logistical, that will allow governing board members to circle back with me and ask me any questions about what I've presented here in the superintendent's report. I know we're limited on questions on a superintendent's report, but the good news is when we get to the transportation informational item, you can circle back and ask me any questions about uh, the information that I've communicated here. Board Clerk Shaw, members of the governing board to wrap up the governing board report uh, despite the hiccups uh, with transportation, the district is looking very, very good at the moment. Overall, it's day four of the school year. The district is up 1,885 students over the 40th day for the 2021 school year. That's a very, very positive sign of an enrollment recovery. 
The Tucson Unified Virtual Academy has exceeded 2,300 students in enrollment. Kindergarten enrollment has returned to its pre-pandemic levels at over 3,100 students. That's an incredibly, incredibly extraordinary sign of a recovery. We didn't think would happen this quick with one of our most important grade levels, uh, kindergarten. The district's high school enrollment is up 1,297 students uh, over the 40th day of enrollment for the 2021 school year. And the big carriers of that increase, Pueblo, Choya, and Tucson High, respective, uh, each respectively are up 250 students each. So we've had some very, very hungry young people to get back to being warriors, chargers, and badgers. They're excited and they're back. And those schools are off to strong starts. Board Clerk Shaw, members of the governing board, board president uh, counts. That concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Jahid. Next up is call to the audience. During the audience call, the board clerk will recognize speakers and maintain order by setting appropriate limitations. The governing board is committed to the safety of the entire TUSD community. In order to observe the recommended safeguards for reducing the rate of spread of COVID-19, the following procedures related to the call to the audience portion of board meetings will be observed. All public comments for the meeting were accepted in written form. Public comments will be read into the record by the program coordinator of staff services to the governing board. Individuals addressing the board should observe rules of propriety and good conduct and refrain from impertinent or slanderous remarks. TUSD serves students from all ages, so speakers should be aware that children may be present or listening. Our staff will make sure each board member receives a copy. Conclusion of the call to the audience, the governing board president will ask if individual board members wish to respond to criticism made by those who have addressed the board, wish to ask staff to review a matter, or wish to ask that a matter be put on a future agenda. By law, at most two board members can address any single issue raised during the call to the audience. Contents of this part are public information. Our first letter is from Gisela Contreras. Dear board members, I am not sure if you have heard, but recently on social media, specifically Instagram, Sabino students, a part of the Turning Point USA Club, have shown videos of them peacefully protesting against masks and have started an online petition to end the mask mandate at school. I was wondering if, if this club has been approved yet since the school year has just started. As social media typically goes, it spread pretty quickly, and they have said that they've archived their posts due to students leaving hate comments and being told to do so by their higher ups. As someone who is vaccinated and has gotten COVID, I know how serious this virus is and how deadly it can be for, to those who are not vaccinated. I am worried about the safety of students and teachers and have been since this virus started which is why I'm asking you to not remove the mask mandate and to also think about how to proceed to educate these students on how serious this virus is and why you have all voted to mandate mask until Governor Ducey's anti-mask mandate. These students are wrongfully re representing not only Sabino High School, but TUSD and Tucson as a whole. Thank you for your time. Wish you the best and stay healthy. Gisela Contreras. Next is Denise Krabalkian. Dear TUSD Administration and Governing Board, I am a parent with a child in Tucson Unified School District Schools. On Wednesday, August 4th, the day before the first day of school, I tuned in to listen to the board meeting regarding face masks. My main concern about face masks is that no one is acknowledging that there is a downside to masks. If I had a ch small child, I would be very concerned as we know that so much of learning how to read is by seeing and hearing. Without being able to see a teacher's mouth, we are putting struggling readers at a severe disadvantage. They are also not learning the nonverbal cues that are so important in child development. Masks do, do have a cost. They are not benign. We know the data on what happens to a child who does not read by third grade. These children are four times as likely to not graduate high school. For society and that child, this is a huge cost. We do not have the data that shows the efficacy in masking young children. 
I will also say that I do not agree with an educational institution teaching kids that it is okay to not follow a law if you just really, really don't like it. My primary reason for writing is about the call to the audience on Wednesday. It was so disrespectful to the entire TSD community. Moving the call to the audience until after you have made your decision and voted on it most certainly violated the spirit of what a call to the audience is supposed to be. But while I was on the Facebook page wanting to express my dismay at the call to the audience decision, I stumbled across the transportation issues and was horrified. 36 hours before school started, parents were finding out that they were no longer any normal bus routes. They were having to decide between keeping, their, keeping a job or getting their child to school. This is unacceptable. Perhaps instead of spending time and energy weaponizing the TUSD board, district, children, and tax dollars up as a political cudgel against the governor's office, your energy could be better spent doing the things that are normal to school districts. These things include educating children and also when children are on a bus route to make sure they get picked up and taken to school. Please do better. The children in this district deserve it. Regards, Denise Korbalkin. This is Melissa Conlon. TUSD school board members, we are opposed to the mask mandate for K-12. You are all in violation of our parental rights under ARS 1-601 and 1-602. Take a stand against child abuse. ARS 8-201. This establishes the legal definition of abuse in state law. It reads, Abuse means the infliction or allowing of physical injury, impairment of bodily function, or disfigurement of the infliction of or allowing another person to cause serious emotional damage as evidenced by severe anxiety, depression, withdrawal, or untoward aggressive behavior, and which emotional damage is diagnosed by a medical doctor or psychologist and is caused by the acts of omissions of an individual who has the care, custody, and control of a child. School districts and the Pima County Health Department in Arizona are violating state statute and abuse our children with impunity. Unlike violations of the parents' rights statutes, there are, are real and serious consequences for committing the crime of child abuse. ARS 13-3623. Under circumstances other than those likely to produce death or serious physical injury to a child, any person who causes a child to suffer physical injury or abuse or having the care of, or custody of a child who causes or permits the child or health of the child to be injured or who causes or permits to a child to be placed in a situation where the person or health of the child is endangered is guilty of an offense as follows. One, if done intentionally or knowingly, the offense is a class four felony. Two, if done recklessly, the offense is a class five felony. Three, if done with criminal negligence, the offense is a class six felony. It goes on to state that abuse, when used in reference to a child, means abuse as defined in Section 8-201. FYI, breathing is a critical bodily function and mask covering the nose and mouth impairs it. Officials in our state have turned a blind eye to this and allowed our children to literally be abused in the name of protecting others. We cannot continue to allow children to be sacrificed to provide a false sense of security to adults that refuse to accept scientific data and evidence. Abusing children so that some people can feel better is not acceptable, ever, not even in a pandemic. The school district governing board members that vote to continue mask requirement policies and district staff that enforce mask wearing by children must be charged accordingly to the letter of the law, as will you. We need immediate action on this as there are districts that have been making decisions about masks for the start and remainder of the school year. This is, a, this is to inform you of the statute because your knowledge of it increases your penalty from a class four felony to a class six felony. Any supervisor who puts their name to pass this document Excuse will be dealt me, with. Excuse me, Ms. Benya, your you are minutes are up. Thank you. You're welcome. Next is Irene Sade. Hi, I'm a parent of a TUSD student. I received the below email from the district on July 14th. It's so clear that you acknowledge HB 2898 restricts you from requiring masks for our students. You also acknowledge this bill went into effect on July 1st, 2021. 
What in God's creation has now given you the right to defy this law and make our kids wear a mask at school? You are teaching our kids to only obey the laws and rules they want to. How would our principals and teachers feel if our kids picked which classes, which class rules to follow and which not to follow? If there are families who do not feel safe coming to school with other students who are maskless, you have given them the option to go online. Our kids should not have to suffer because some families do not feel safe. Governor Ducey made it clear, Arizona does not allow mask mandates, vaccine mandates, vaccine passports, or discrimination in schools based on who is or who isn't vaccinated. We pass all this, we pass all of this info law and it will not change. I demand that you obey the law and remove the mask requirements from TUSD. Hello to you, Tucson Unified Community. I hope you're enjoying your summer break. On 630, Governor Ducey signed the Arizona Budget Bill HB 2898, which could impact school funding throughout the state. In the bill, there is also a provision that prohibits counties, cities, towns, schools, and school districts from requiring students or staff to wear a face covering during a school hours on a school property. This went into effect on July 1st, 2021. While this decision means students and staffs no longer are required to wear masks in Tucson Unified School District, our district, along with federal, state, and local health officials, highly recommended, recommend a mask be worn by anyone who is not vaccinated. Thus, masks are, masks are optional. At the upcoming July 20th TUSD governing board meeting, safety recommendations for school reentry will be discussed. While the HB 28 98 will no longer allow the district to determine masking protocols. We recognize there are a number of families that are concerned about returning to school in person. TUSD has developed Tucson Unified Virtual Academy, a remote online instructional model. To learn about or sign up for this option, please go to Tucson Unified Virtual Academy K12 TUSD1.org or email tuvac12 at tusd1.org to answer your questions. Thank you for your continued support of our schools. Please stay safe and healthy. We look forward to seeing everyone on the first day of school, August 5th. Sincerely, Dr. Gabriel Trujillo. Respectfully, Irene Sade. Yes, Superintendent Trujillo, Board President Counts, Clerk Shaw, members of the board, and Mr. Ross. My name is Judy Morellin. I am speaking once again as the lead advocate for the TUSD School Librarian Restoration Project. I also serve on the Advisory Council for an Institute of Museum and Library Services grant-funded project, School Librarian Investigation, Decline or Evolution, as known as SLIDE. Slide researchers analyzed data from the National Center for Education Statistics and published the Slide Perspectives Report last month. While the entire report is important, these two findings are critical to our work at TUSD School Librarian Advocates. Districts with higher levels of poverty, more minority students, and more English language learners were less likely to have librarians. Majority Hispanic districts were more than twice as likely to have no librarians and less than half as likely to have the highest level of librarian staffing. Lance and Cashel, 2021, page six. And this study also discovered that in most cases, once librarian positions were eliminated, they were not reinstated. Lance and Cashel, 2021, page 85. All 42,000 plus TUSD students, educators, and families deserve access to a high quality school library programs led by state certified school librarians. TUSD can be the district in the state and in the county that shows literacy learning is a high priority in a district with the majority of minority students, students who qualify for free and reduced meals, and a large number of students who are English language learners. Let's show how Let's show all our students and their families that TUSD decision makers are committed to giving students the tools they need to succeed. Let's show that we understand that reading proficiency and literacy learning are the foundations on which all academic subjects and life pursuits depend. While our group is working to rescind the legislators tax cuts for the wealthy and restore propositions to 208 intended funding levels, I am also working at the national level to help bring federal funding to districts like TUSD. Together, we can achieve the ultimate goal of literacy learning equity across the district for the benefit of all TUSD students. Thank you, Judy Morellin. Next is Mr. Ross. Thank you, Judy. 
is Robert Lipson. Dear board members, I want to say thank you to the entire board for voting to require that masks be worn inside TUSD buildings. As many students are either are either yet to be vaccinated or are yet eligible for the vaccine, wearing a mask is one of the best ways to prevent the spread of the horrible COVID virus and keep our community safe. Sincerely, Robert Lipson. Next up is Andrew Kingsford. I wanted to thank you for caring for our students and teachers. We as communities, as a community, appreciate your action to require masks. Have a great school year. Regards, Andy Kunzberg. Margaret Cheney. Dear members of the board, thank you for all that you have done to create a smooth transition from the pandemic school we faced last year. TEA is especially grateful for your commitment in keeping employees and as safe as possible through the use of masks and air filters and other PPE devices. This year has proven to be a rather trying one. As you know, new virus variants have been reported in the news just about every day. The fact that it spreads faster and may affect our younger students who have no recourse through a vaccine especially con is especially concerning. While we would like to see as many adults as possible vaccinated as quickly as possible, we recognize the issues and complications that surround this goal. We would like to see more tracing done and understand that there is an easier, simpler, less painful method of conducting the tracing of the virus than before. We believe that, all, that we all want to keep our students as safe as possible. Therefore, we are supportive of contact tracing at the site level on a voluntary basis. Students whose parents approve and any staff member should have access to low cost or free and painless testing for the virus while our community is in the midst of a Delta variant. We feel that this would help trace, trace the infection rate as well as forewarn school sites and communities of the virus. Should that opportunity present itself in the near future, we would ask that the district take a serious look at allowing site testing so as to mitigate the spread of the virus as soon as possible. Thank you, sincerely, Margaret Cheney, President of the Tucson Education Association. Next is Amy Sonera. Last week's emergency board meeting was a complete and total disappointment. First of all, voting to vote the call to the to move the call to the audience after the action item. That tells us that you already had a dis your decision made. You didn't even give the public the opportunity to voice their concerns. That is a really bad example of public service. Second, you have been complying with the same state law, making mask optional for the last month, and now you decide to change your course. That is a really bad example to set for our kids. If you don't like a law, just don't follow it. Third, keeping board meetings virtual is just a way to avoid parents face-to-face. Fourth, miscounts the president of the board not showing up to the board meeting because she disagreed with not following the state law is not acceptable. You are elected to represent kids and parents. You should have been there to voice your concern and dissent, even if you were outnumbered. Since last Thursday, August 5th, each school within the TUSD district has been enforcing the mask mandate differently, which is unfair. Some kids and staff have gone to school without a mask and have had no issues, while other students like mine have been denied access to their education if they don't wear a mask. Some teachers have been threatened or given letters of insubordination if they don't comply with your mask mandate. The district is all over the place and that tells us what you are doing is not legal. Just yesterday, I received an email from our principal stating she received guidance from TUSD leadership and legal that now my children will be allowed to attend school without a mask. We know your rule is a, is a farce and you are just trying to push it on everyone who will comply. This is no longer about the virus. It's about your control. The data from the county on hospitalizations and deaths do not support your narrative of masking up kids. Thank you, Amy Sonieta. Last is Lillian Fox. This month's talent acquisition report, the, bud, the board is being asked to approve shows zero bus drivers and zero bus driver trainees have been hired. 
Going back for many months, the monthly ta talent acquisition report showed TUSD has failed to hire any bus drivers or driver trainees while steadily losing drivers month after month. At the same time, TUSD will st still pays new drivers less per hour than both Amphi and Flowing Wells. Unlike those districts, TUSD also does not pay new hire experienced drivers extra for each year of experience. TUSD's inability to provide necessary transportation to students is an HR and transportation department created disaster for many working families. It's urgent for TUSD to contact every bus driver who resigned or retired and pay them to return. TUSD also needs to contact every bus driver who transferred from TUSD to a higher paying job or a job with more hours per week and return them to, dri a dri to driving a school bus at their current pay until they can be replaced by qualified new drivers. Lillian Fox. And that was the last letter. Thank you to everyone who wrote in to us. Dr. Trujillo, would you like to respond first? Yes, um, Board Clerk Shaw, I want to um, respond. Uh, I do think that we've got some really good solutions there proposed, that last speaker, Ms. Fox. I, I, that's definitely a, um, a strategy I'll work on with our uh, HR and employee relations. We have had uh, several bus drivers transfer to other jobs in the district. If that is an option on the table, we certainly would like to explore it. And of course, with regard to the mask issue, uh, we recognize that there are very strong points of view on both ends uh, of the issue, and we certainly appreciate the feedback communicated uh, during call to the audience today. Uh, the administration has been uh, as consistent as possible uh, across all 86 of our schools. We've had strong communication with principals about expectations for 100% compliance. We would uh, gladly follow up on any individual incidents any individual incident uh, in which we have an employee that is not uh, complying with governing board policy. As stated publicly before, students are different. This is not an opportunity for us to suspend and kick kids out of school. This is an opportunity when students don't comply with masks to work together with families to find a point of compromise and eventual compliance for students. And of course, exploring other options, namely our Tucson Unified Virtual Academy. Thank you very much, uh, Board Clerk Shaw. Ms. Shaw, I'd like to respond. Go ahead. Okay, I'd first like to respond to the um, person that made a comment that I was not at the board meeting because of my opposition to mask wearing. First of all, that is completely false. Um, many people are unaware of this, but this is a volunteer position. I have a full-time job outside of my uh, volunteer position as a board member, and I uh, was unable to take off time work to be at that emergency board meeting. And I'd uh, secondly like to say I was in disagreement originally, originally with how the board uh, voted that day. But after seeing um, school after school in Arizona being affected and our children being negatively affected by um, the inability to uh, do a simple mitigation strategy of mask wearing. I am in complete support of my fellow board members in their decision um, made that day. Mm -hmm. Secondly, as a life, um, the next uh, speaker I'd like to uh, respond to was the speaker that commented about board members and the child abuse and you know as a lifelong advocate for children and families abused children working for dcs uh, courts protecting children my entire life i take great offense to that comment um and you know what i'm i'm done with mincing words equating mask wearing with child abuse is just stupid I'm not going to listen to it anymore. And I just wanted to make that publicly clear. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Counts. Any other uh, discussion board members? Uh, Moving on to uh, consent agenda, item 5.1, approval of consent agenda items 5.2 through 5.2. Yes, uh, Board Clerk Shaw, members of the Governing Board, uh, before I formally recommend the consent agenda item for your consideration, 
for the consent agenda in its entirety. Just want to take a moment to highlight just a couple of uh, good news items. Number one, I want to say thank you to WestEd and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for item number five for tonight. Your vote to approve the uh, consent agenda will include the acceptance of $400,000 to the district for exceptional uh, professional development for teachers in the area of math pedagogy. So we're looking forward to putting that money to good use and providing some great professional development opportunities for our teachers in the math education community. Your vote to approve the consent agenda will also include item 5.5, $240,000 coming into the district through the Arizona School Safety Grant, uh, the Arizona State School Safety Grant. This will provide counselors and social workers. It's gonna be funding four, um, it's gonna be providing counselors and social workers for McGee, Marshall, Sewell, and Safford. Uh, and that will be for uh, the, the social workers. Uh, and so, and we're very, very excited about this opportunity. And uh, we just wanted to highlight those items on consent this evening. And with that, I will formally recommend for governing board consideration for approval, the consent agenda as arranged items 5.2, through 5.11. Uh, Ms. Shaw, Go ahead. I did, um, I, I wanted to take a point of personal privilege, I'm sorry. Um, we did in our TOC community lose uh, a student to gun violence. Um, one of our seventh graders from Dietz K-8 and Principal Jesus Vasquez sent out a letter to the community. Um, it, it, and I'll just quote it. It's, it is with deep regret and sadness that I inform you of the death of one of our students, Avante Saez, um, and he was the victim of gun violence um, on the 6th. And so I'm wondering if we could do a moment of silence. I was hoping to sort of time it in between the superintendent's report. I just wanted to extend our condolences to the Dietz family, or the Dietz community, our school community. Thank you. I know that our um, our counseling department is is working with the community, so I just wanted to extend my condolences to Avante's family as well. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, uh, <clears throat> do we have a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented? Ms. Shaw, so moved. Do have a second? I'll second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> I don't, and please board members remember to vote online. Uh, item 6.1, administrative appointments. Here we go. Yes, uh, members of the governing board, item 6.1. Uh, we tonight uh, would like to recommend a longtime TUSD uh, educator, most recently professional development academic trainer, uh, held a, a, a variety of teacher leadership positions, uh, primarily at Tucson High. He also is a uh, American Sign Language interpreter, an extensive background in working with uh, ex ed students as well. And tonight he is our recommendation for assistant principal at uh, Tucson High. So tonight we'd like for governing board consideration for our recommendation to appoint Mr. Christopher Hickson as the assistant principal at Tucson High. Question, board members? Move the item. Second. All those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Passes. Uh, Dr. Trujillo, can you remind me of which one uh, we removed from that? Yes, uh, Board Clerk Shaw, we did pull the recommendation for Palo Verde due to the unavailability of the applicant. Okay, thank you. So item 6.3, consideration of appointment for a new member to the TUSD Audit Committee. Yes, absolutely. Um, governing board members, uh, you've had an opportunity to review the resume for tonight's recommendation uh, Jody Perrin is the audit committee's recommendation for uh, appointment this evening. She currently is the assistant program manager for adult basic education for college and career, the El Pueblo Adult Education Learning Center. Uh, prior to that, she was the advanced uh, program coordinator uh, at a tutoring center, at Pima Community College Desert Vista campus. She brings uh, some great experience here in post-secondary education that will be welcome on the audit committee. And tonight, the recommendation is Jody Perrin. Ms. Shaw? Yes. Before we move the item, I'd like to know that Mr. Hickson, who we just appointed to um, the Tucson High Assistant Principals on the call, and usually we have a chance for them to speak. Thank you. I, I forgot about that. I apologize. Um, that's today. Yes, thank you, uh, President Counts, board members, Dr. Trujillo, I just want to thank you all, uh, as well as Principal Rodriguez and uh, the regional superintendents for this opportunity, and uh, you know all the people that have allowed me to, to mentor with them and provided professional opportunities. I'm really excited to, to rejoin the community at Tucson High, and uh, I'm just, I'm pumped to get started as soon as I can. Congratulations. So much, Congratulations. Congratulations, Mr. Hickson. Oh, Ms. Shaw, can I interrupt really quick? Absolutely. I'm sorry, I had to step away to use the restroom really quick and I uh, missed Mr. Hickson's um, uh, appointment. So I just wanted to congratulate Mr. Hickson and say I know you're a wonderful educator and Tucson High is lucky to have you. So thank you for serving. Thank you, I'm excited to be there. Ms. Shaw, I'll move item 6.3. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shaw. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Excuse yeah. me, um, Board Clerk Dr. Shaw. We do have Dr. Kelly uh, for item 6.3 from the Audit Committee. If he would like to say a few words about our newly appointed member, Dr. Kelly. Do we have Dr. Kelly, Dr. William Kelly? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, Mr. Kelly, thank you for um, serving the district. Looks like he's connecting the audio still. There we go. Hi, Ms. Uh, Dr. Kelly. Thank you for serving the district. If you want to say a few words. Well, I'm uh, proud to recommend the young lady. I think she's got a lot on the ball. I think she'll make an excellent member of the audit committee. Um, I feel we can do a lot to help you as a board and, uh, and the superintendent with our committee. We have two openings. Uh, we need people that are interested in doing it. The feeling I get on um, Mrs. P Mrs. Perrin is that being a parent, she has broader insight into at the school level to what we need on the committee. And I was proud to see her apply. I was proud to see her attend the meeting and ask, answer questions. Um, 
I'm a long-term educator, and I also taught strategic management at the University of Arizona, and I looked at her skills and purposely asked some questions, and she came out like a spitfire and ready to run, and that's why I'm glad she's on our committee. So I highly recommend her, and thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Shaw? Yes. I was just informed by our legal counsel that we need to determine a term for this individual. It's not set in the audit committee charter. Mm -hmm. And so we need to determine a term no more than five years. And such term shall end on August 31st of an odd number year. So I imagine that would be a four-year term. Ms. Shaw, that's the standard. And so I'll move to um, have this term for um, Ms. Person, Ms. Barron to be for four years. I'll second. Oh, would we just modify the, oh, never mind. I'm sorry. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you uh, for your recommendation, Dr. Kelly. Thank you. Moving on to item 6.4, consideration of appointment of a new member to serve on the Budget Advisory Committee. Yes, uh, members of the Governing Board, of course, a few months back, the Governing Board uh, took the amazing step to increase transparency and community involvement in the district's fiscal decision making by establishing the Budget Advisory Committee uh, comprised of community members and, and members of the district community um, working together with our finance department and the administration to review all of the district's uh, proposals, whether they're additional expenditure requests, goals, also to help the, dis help the governing board achieve its fiscal goals for each successive school year. One member that we would like to nominate uh, or, or one constituent, if you will, supporter of the district that we would like to see seated at the table is Southern Arizona Leadership Council. Uh, they've been a strong supporter of the governing of, of the district for several years. Uh, they have voiced uh, support for pro-education initiatives, regardless of partisan affiliation at all levels of government. And uh, tonight, I'd like to recommend that we that the governing board consider for membership, Mr. Ross McAllister, uh, who would uh, is a member of the Southern Arizona Leadership Council, to join the Budget Advisory Committee. Now, R Mr. Ross McAllister doesn't have a formal resume because he's had the same job for 30 years as the founder of his own company. Um, he is currently um, the uh, owner and founder of McElroy uh, Management, uh, which formed with MC Companies, and he has been running this company for uh, the last uh, several years. His background, of course, in construction operations and management. He's involved in land purchase, zoning and permitting, site development, architectural design, construction budgeting, construction financing, construction management, and through development and acquisition, MC Companies currently manages approximately 6,000 units valued at over $800 million. So uh, as a head of a company that, that manages over $800 million uh, in assets, uh, he has a, a very, very intimate knowledge of what it takes to maybe take a look at TUSD's $560 million budget and contribute that way. So tonight I'd like to recommend Mr. Ross McAllister uh, for appointment to the Governing Board's Budget Advisory Committee. So moved. I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And Mr. McAllister, are you with us today? Do we have Mr. McAllister on? 
Dr. Trujillo, he's not in this meeting. Well, I will speak on behalf of, of Ross. I uh, had a nice conference call with him last week. He's very excited to join the Budget Advisory Committee. And on his behalf, um, I want to thank the Governing Board for approving his appointment. He looks forward to joining the group. Five, yes, governing board members, um, as you know, one of your established committees, the Employee Benefits Trust Board, uh, requires an ex officio governing board member. So one of the five uh, to sit in on the meetings and to serve in the ex officio capacity. Previous to tonight, uh, governed ex governing ex ex governing board member for his two stints on the board, uh, Gov uh, Bruce Burke, was the ex officio governing board representative, uh, effectively replacing Mark Stegeman upon Dr. Stegeman's retirement. So now, with the term out of his interim term and the arrival of our three new governing board members, it's time for the governing board to designate its governing board representative to serve in the ex officio capacity. So tonight I'd like to bring forward uh, the recommendation for Dr. Ravi Gravoy Shah to serve in that capacity. So moved. A second, a second. All those in favor say aye. Wait, I'm sorry, Ravi, Dr. Ravi, would you like to be appointed? <laughs> no one asked you. I just want to make sure. <laughs> We're just throwing him to the wolves. No, I'm right. excited to serve um, our community in this way, I think, you know, advocating okay. for our teachers and staff um, by, by looking outside the box and really trying to figure out how we can best uh, keep costs down uh, and make sure services are appropriate for health, dental, vision, and other services are going to be important. And so I appreciate this trust um, in, in me and uh, hope to work with uh, our, to support our teachers and staff with this. Thank you. So shall we revoke? Give me your did this all go okay, um, Mr. Ross? Mr. Ross stepped out. Mr. Ross stepped out of the room. Okay, right on. Well, it passed unanimously. And thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robbie. Thank <laughs> Thanks, you. Robbie. Yeah, I think he'll do a fabulous job. <laughs> um, moving on, item 7.1. Unified School District COVID-19 Readiness and Response District Update, Dr. Yes, Yes, um, Governing Board Clerk Shaw, members of the Governing Board, uh, as promised, every single Governing Board meeting uh, for the indefinite, for the foreseeable future, will include this COVID-19 Readiness and Response Update. The, the update will always be scheduled as study action, which will allow the Governing Board to either vote or provide specific direction to the administration to take action in any areas of its proposed mitigation plan. Tonight, tonight's update consists of three major components. First, just a general overview of, of a rollback of some initial mitigation recommendations that the administration made in the face of the Delta variant as it continues its path across Pima County. Secondly, we've asked our health director, uh, Nikki Steffen, to provide an update on the Pima County Health Department's disease data dashboard. And uh, I think we've got some even zip code, da zip code data uh, available for her review with you tonight, uh, taking a look at different zip codes across the Tucson Unified School District and infection and transmission rates across those zip codes. Also, uh, Ms. Steffen will be outlining new direction that we've received from the Pima County Health Department regarding uh, structured expectations for what we can assign as quarantine measures and isolation measures for both vaccinated and unvaccinated students, which of course will provide us a significant level of coverage as this direction is coming from the Pima County Health Department. And then we will also be uh, the centerpiece of our update this evening will be a presentation by Mr. Tim Leiden of Concentric. Concentric is the state's 
uh, approved vendor for classroom level, otherwise known as pool testing for COVID-19 for school districts and schools across Arizona, free of charge to any district. And what pool testing is, it's a weekly testing of students that have opted in to be tested for COVID-19 and at the classroom level across every school uh, on an opt-in basis. That will, of course, that will provide the district a rapid response to any positive COVID-19 situation during, and not just the school level, but at the classroom level. And then, of course, the update will feature opportunities for the governing board members to offer any feedback, additional direction, or take action in any areas of interest or need with regard to our, our, our mitigation plan. So first up, I believe is going to be Leslie. Uh, rolling through some of the, the major areas that we've rolled back and adjusted due to the state of transmission here in Pima County. And then we'll follow with, uh, I think we'll go with Mr. Leiden, uh, who will be sort of the centerpiece of tonight's update as he provides the overview of the pool testing proposal. And then we'll finish with Ms. Stefan. Take it away. Great, thank you, Dr. Trujillo. Good evening, Governing Board Clerks. Counts, Clerk Shaw, excuse me, um, board members, Dr. Trujillo and Council Ross. Uh, tonight, I'll give you a brief overview of some of the protocol changes that uh, we have made for the start of school. Um, next slide, Jean. So we'll discuss uh, four different things. Uh, one, the mass protocols. Uh, we'll also look at department and site level meetings. Um, the volunteers and how they'll, there'll be some changes there. And then um, it was asked that we share the vaccine clinics that we've done in our district um, and the few that are also planned going through August. Uh, next slide. So as we've seen some of these before, but um, as we all know, the um, WHO, CDC, Pima County Health Department have recommended that um, everyone vaccinated, vaccinated or not, uh, wear a mask indoors and in K through 12 schools um, due to the Delta variant variant that is um, occurring now. Um, next slide. Um, for TUSD, our protocol changed last week. So as we know, masks are required for all staff, students and visitors when they're on our TUSD property. Uh, next slide. For our meetings, um, we have made some changes to our um, staff and school level and district level meetings. We have asked that um, when possible, that for all department and site level meetings that they be done virtually at this time, um, that all staff meetings also will be remote and that at this time that professional development will be remote um, to make sure that we keep um, contact with each other limited. However, our parent um, meetings or any events or activities at the school can um, still occur, but with masks. Next slide. Um, and a couple changes to the recommendations for school and student reentry. Um, as um, noted earlier, we said that masks are being recommended by the CDC and Pima County Health Department for all K through 12 school staff and students. Uh, nothing changes as far as morning entry, that stays the same. Uh, classroom requirements will be the same where they're using hand sanitizer, um, you know, anytime in the classroom, if they're sharing manipulatives, anything like that hand sanitizer when they go to lunch or and or wash their hands as often as possible. Uh, a change has happened when we have parents and volunteers on campus, they will be allowed, but we will request that everyone will be required to wear a mask uh, when they come on to our property. And then the final reminder that if you have any type of COVID-like symptoms or have tested positive for COVID, to please stay home. Next slide. Um, any questions on those three big things? Um, Ms. Shaw? Okay. Yeah, the only, the only concern that I have is I just think that we really need to watch um, where we are as a community and where now that we're highly, we're in 
the high range, like highly transmissible for COVID. Um, I do think we need to look at the mitigation strategies as much of them as we did when we first opened at the last quarter um, of last school year. And as much as I value volunteers, I, I think it's important that we may want to um, at some point ask our volunteers if they've been vaccinated. I mean, these are volunteers. These are not employees that are required. I mean, these are people that we allow on our campuses. And so I'm wondering if legally we have any um, additional flexibility because I know that we are just trying to keep our students as safe as possible and still have volunteers on campus. I think at, at some point we're gonna have to look at that as well. Sure, we'll certainly review that um, with um, Council Ross and determine if there's anything additional we should do there as the um, numbers or anything changes in the states and our areas um, susceptibility to the virus. Thank you. Ms. Shaw. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I, I appreciate the presentation, um, Ms. Leinhart. But my question is, I know that there's open houses coming up. In fact, my daughter's got hers next week. So um, I'm assuming that the same type of mitigation, how are we going to, and I guess that goes along with Ms. Corhalva's question, how are we going to be able to do those open houses safely? I understand that we're going to, we've asked parents and staff and students to wear masks while on our campuses, but open houses tend to be, can be pretty crowded. So is there a, a district plan for each school as they're going through the open houses or is this, are we leaving it up to the schools individually? So I was, I was hoping we could have a little bit of discussion on that. Um, before that gets answered, I have some additional questions in the same vein, Michelle. Right. Um, just to kind of piggyback on, on um, uh, Ms. Luna Rose. Uh, so we've made a big deal about kind of staff meetings and staff uh, educational times and big groups. Um, and do we have any set policy on uh, assemblies as well? I've, there was an email about a large assembly that I think a lot of us received at one of our high schools. And so what is our expectation about indoor, large indoor events of students, especially in light of us canceling or, or having Zoom, all of, our, all of our staff meetings and staff events? Yeah, so I will, I will jump in here. Our, our first initial recommendations were in these three areas. We are really working hard to preserve the flavor of school for the young people that have come back. We're trying really hard not to return to the state of 1920. And we were, part of the reason we're, we are very, very uh, excited and enthusiastic about the mask mandatory is because we would like to continue those student activities to the extent possible with appropriate spacing. So before we ban assemblies, uh, I also would like the opportunity to kind of visit these oppor an opportunity maybe to limit them, uh, uh, different ideas with our principal group on how we can still do them, but maybe do them on a smaller scale now that masks are mandatory. I also think that we need to look at a different approach to elementary than we do high school. Element, um, high school kids obviously have the opportunity to be vaccinated. Our elementary students don't. I do think that student get-togethers and, and, and assemblies and groupings, I do think that we need to take a harder look at elementary because of the non-vaccination factor and perhaps delay those a little bit more. So I certainly would like to work with my team on that and bring back a hard and fast recommendation uh, for the meeting on the 24th. I think with open house in the same spirit, you know, we're still trying to provide parents that opportunity to come in and look at their open school. We're going to need them to comply with masks. We're going to need everybody to have a mask on. The same mitigation strategies that we've been using in terms of hand sanitizer, spacing with lines, in terms of parents lining up to see the teachers in the room six feet apart, uh, teachers only seeing uh, one or two parents at a time in their classrooms. We certainly can put together some hard and fast uh, logistical requirements for those events and get it to the board and the community. And I would say I know that um, several schools have also asked me and my team about live streaming or how to do Facebook Live of their open houses um, and some of their activities so that parents can still participate, but they don't necessarily have to come on campus. So I know some schools have also looked at that. 
Okay. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, we'll go to the next slide. I have a question, Ms. Ben Clark. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could communicate a little bit about uh, the possibility of students social distancing in classrooms. Um, much of that on the presentation. I know many classrooms were not able to physically distance six feet, but perhaps the three feet. Address that, and also is um, like sometimes, uh, like in my daughter's class, for instance, there are desk shields being utilized, uh, but for other classrooms, they're not. I'm wondering if like parents, if there if there are no desk shields in a certain classroom, can can parents like request from the school site or the teacher uh, for their student to have a desk shield? We have enough available for that. Yeah, you know, Board Clerk Shaw, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, uh, desk shields are available upon request through our operations department. We've received mixed reviews um, from parents, community, and even the board uh, in, in previous mitigation presentations. We've had a couple of board members saying that they would prefer not for, for us not to spend our ESSER dollars on sort of cosmetic um, attempts to mitigate COVID-19 and, and spend those dollars only on proven efforts uh, to mitigate the virus. And so we, we received that feedback that, that really there's not a lot of scientific proof around the effectiveness of death shields, that they're kind of more aesthetic and, and cosmetic to make people feel safer. But that being said, we, we still make them available. And so any teacher that wants them can have them. Uh, any teacher that, that wants those death shields, absolutely have them with regard to the question about social distancing because we're not allowed to limit physical enrollment uh, we are struggling and that's where the mask mandate is a huge thing. it's a huge mitigation strategy because if you are going to be in a situation either in a classroom or a cafeteria where although we're better in the cafeteria than we are in the classroom this cafeteria is uh, in our elementary schools go one grade level at a time. There's greater ability to do six feet than there is in a classroom where you have 20 kids. Still having those air purifiers across the district helps. Having masks on every single kid helps. Having masks on every single employee helps. But unfortunately, we're still compromised in terms of even being able to do three feet uh, in our classrooms when we are required, we're, we're not able for previous executive orders to, to limit uh, in-person attendance for families that request it. Ms. Shaw. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Chia, speaking of uh, cafeterias, we had kind of communicated last week about uh, doing some surveys and figuring out what this is a state. I think we, we learned from last year during the COVID uh, crisis how restaurants uh, have been a significant source of infection and spread of COVID uh, amongst adults and families. Uh, and I'm concerned about our meal times when the students are unmasked uh, and not socially distanced if that's not possible and what is gonna be our mitigation strategies for that. And, and so I'd like to hear more about what your surveys of the district superintendents uh, were able to find. Um, and I like this to be a, 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 top, a high priority in terms of figuring out options because if transmission rates go even higher than they are now, uh, we're going we're gonna to have some really bad consequences uh, during mealtime uh, transmission. Absolutely, Dr. Rivosha, we're going to put that together for the 24th, but for the interim, uh, I'd, last, I'd like to ask uh, Richard Sanchez, our regional assistant superintendent, um, to, and, and along with Flory, I'd like them to address just a couple of aspects of mitigation. First, cafeteria, um, Richard, I, if you wanna bring up um, some of the photos sure. of some of our cafeterias that will show current mitigation uh, using what's called the green dot system. Uh, and then uh, Flory, you and Richard, something I wanted to inform the governing board about was progress made a finalized system for remote instruction for quarantine students uh, and and how that is going to be put into place so let's let's take the cafeteria first uh, you know what the current mitigation strategies are then come back on the 24th to see enhancements improvements uh, for what that looks like mr sanchez sure 
Good evening, uh, Board President Shaw, Governing Board Members, Dr. Trujillo. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if you can see my screen uh, with the picture on it. Leslie, I see you're shaking your head. So uh, assuming yes, if these are just examples of uh, various layouts for the cafeterias that are taking place throughout our district. If you notice uh, on this particular photo, there are green dots that we have utilized that date back uh, to last year um, as well, in which students would sit apart from one another, have the opportunity to uh, have their meal, and then as soon as their meal is done, uh, be able to put on their mask and then head outside for the remainder of that lunchtime. Usually, um, we're doing about uh, lunches are uh, per consensus must be 30 minutes. And so what we are seeing is about about 10 to 15 minutes of students in the cafeteria eating uh, and then spending the rest of their time uh, outside. As Dr. Trio stated, it's because we wanna have multiple lun lunch runs uh, at the elementary level in which uh, grade levels can come on in and enjoy that lunch experience uh, without being too packed uh, in that uh, cafeteria setting. And then let me give you another screen share uh, of another picture I've seen. And what we're trying to do uh, in this particular picture is try to keep students about three feet apart from one another um, or have every student sit on one side of the table. Um, so that way they're all facing in the exact uh, same direction. So those are just some examples that we've seen as a regional assistant superintendent team as we've made our way uh, into uh, schools. And our principals are doing a great job of trying to stagger those lunches, uh, have people, uh, students faced uh, in one direction or using the green dot system that uh, I just described. So are there any questions about lunches before we move on to um, our isolated um, target trio? So what, what I'm going to ask as we return on the 24th, okay, is let's let's work with our principals on an outdoor option yes. so that, that, because I know that on, per our agreement with TEA, we're moving away from meals in the classroom. That was something that TEA helped us out with in the early days of the consensus or of, of the pandemic. And, and we thank them for that, but we knew that it was never going to be a long-term commitment. So we don't want to bring that issue back out on the table, but maybe what I'd like us to do is look at for the 24th, let's work with our principals on maybe what an outdoor option could look like, uh, if it's possible, uh, that way we can drain out some of the traffic in the cafeteria. Uh, also, what I also would like to put into play for the 24th is just a general survey as we discussed in terms of what the major challenges are that principals are seeing. And, and number one, it's we know that not at the top of the list is the fact that we can't limit in person. But some of those other challenges like lines, uh, maybe availability of, of, of materials or, or resources, hand sanitizer. We know that we have the air purification units in the cafeteria, but as we process this issue and kind of as I've seen some of the various images coming in from the regional assistant, and thank you regionals for visiting at lunches and forwarding me some of these pictures, I can see that you know we can sort of benefit from letting our principals weigh in in terms of better recommendations for additional enhancements. I could see the need for an outdoor option so that classrooms, a grade level or a classroom in a particular school may opt to eat outside. That's a tremendous help. That's you know 25 fewer kids that need to be funneled into the cafeteria so i'm also interested in putting together an outdoor option for our elementaries to see if we can get that going and coming back on the 24th but i do know that we've relied on the green dot system that you know the kids know it they recognize it they sit apart but at some point masks have to come off right to eat and you know spittles flying the kids when you see they're even though a kid is might be six feet apart from the kid next to them they're less than six feet apart from the kid across. That's kind of like my, my big thing. Mm -hmm. And then as we saw at the top of the graphic, there's those lines, you know, even though the kids have the masks on, there's still those lines. So I think we've got some work to do in this area. Yeah, no, and I appreciate Dr. Trio, you uh, bringing up the outdoor eating spaces. I will say upon our visits to schools during lunchtime, there are those options as of course, 
with uh, the Tucson weather, uh, it depends on uh, last week was fairly warm in the afternoons. And I know that um, you know fewer students decided to eat outside. Uh, we're seeing a little bit more students taking advantage of the outside spaces more at the secondary level of middle school and high school. Uh, but it's speaking to my principals and the other regional speaking to their principals, they do have spaces allocated. I, I think a lot of that is just the weather uh, that, that is uh, maybe not as advantageous for kids to eat out there just yet, but, but they are available. But I will make sure there's a, a more of a plan, a formalized plan in place at the next meeting. Nisha? Go ahead. Uh, thank you for, for putting it. I'm looking forward to seeing that plan on the 24th, and I hope it, whatever plan is presented is implemented as soon as possible. I, I really feel that you know we are kind of that, that our, our vote last week to require mass or is will be for not if we start having a lot of spreads in our in our cafeterias. So whatever we can do to try to increase social distancing uh, is appreciated. Thank you. And then next, the, the next. Um, item that we'd like to share with the board is, is really um, what we can do to help support uh, our students who may have to uh, go into isolation for a period of time. So uh, this evening I am joined by Flory Hewitt, our Assistant Superintendent Curriculum and Instruction, and by our Assistant Superintendent Kanasha Brown uh, from Equity, Diversity, Inclusiveness. And really what we're sharing with you is a conceptual plan that we hope to bring to you on the 24th. Um, in which we are looking at our district alternative education program uh, to really look at re-imaging it uh, to better fit our, our district and our district needs. Uh, this particular program has certificated uh, teachers that help support us uh, throughout the year in providing direct instruction to students. And in utilizing uh, these certificated teachers, uh, we would be able to uh, provide a virtual school environment for our students who are isolated in which they would receive direct instruction via Zoom uh, and be able to participate in receiving instruction from these certificated teachers. And during uh, the time that they are off campus, uh, they would be engaged in that educational experience. They would receive credit, uh, attendance credit, and of course, uh, academic credit for any work that is completed during that time and then that, that credit would be transferred back over to the homeschool teacher uh, when they return back uh, to the campus. So we really feel excited about this opportunity in which uh, we are able as a district to support our students uh, through this uh, model and be able to uh, also help support the teacher who is going to, uh, of course, be educating uh, the students that, that are not in isolation at that point in time. So I'll, I'll chime in here. Traditionally, the district's alternative uh, education program known as DATE, they work with long-term suspended students. Uh, as you know, we've had zero student hearings. Um, we don't have any on the horizon. They're available. And they are a great, a ready workforce that is already used to accepting students on a rolling basis, meaning they don't have a fixed date where they accept students because in the district's alternative education program, they take long-term suspended students and long-term suspensions at all points of the year. So their infrastructure is already there to be able to receive kids on a rolling basis throughout the year as kids are, are in quarantine or kids are in isolation. And so that kind of matches the need with what we have for right now when kids are either uh, identified as having been exposed to positive, case positive individuals, or they themselves are positive. And so now it is sort of this reimagining of DAPE where DAPE now becomes virtual. So now as DAPE might get long-term suspended students, those long-term suspended students then would receive services virtually to match the services that would be provided to students that uh, are in quarantine or isolation this is, I think, a great utilization of an existing program that does great work for students already without making a teacher simultaneously instruct students that are live with them and then have to circle back 
and provide some kind of instruction to students that are in quarantine or they're in a state of isolation. So we're still kind of fleshing out all the details. We're gonna have a formal sort of kick the tires, look under the hood presentation at your August 24th COVID update item. But we wanted to preview it because we do know it's a concern. Uh, we are kicking off school. We're gonna have isolation recommendations and quarantine coming up probably by the end of this week. We're a big district and what we learned from Vail, even with masks, we're gonna have some case positivity showing up. I don't, Kanasha, uh, Flory, did you wanna add anything? No, sir, I think you captured it, but also one of the key goals of reimagining our date was to make sure that from an equity lens, we have the academic continuance. And so we are excited to kind of bring that back and that framework back during the August 24th update. Thank you. Ms. Shaw. Yes. Dr. Trujillo, tell me if there's a better place um, during this meeting to ask this uh, in this presentation here, but I was wondering about like positive cases and what are our plan in terms of individual students uh, quarantining and um, not being on campuses. Uh, at what point do we shut down a, a class or a grade or a school? Like what, is, what is the plan in terms of um, when there's positive cases amongst our students or teachers or staff? That's great. That's for Nikki, uh, and that's coming up. Okay, um, great. Mm -hmm. Reduce our protocols. I know that we kind of jumped the gun and we talked the educational wing, right? When a kid's already in quarantine, right? We're going to use these date teachers, but the whole process of when they get identified, who gets called, how many days, that's going to be a great Nikki, uh, Miss Stefan. So if you can note that, Miss Stefan, when we get there. And if there's no further uh, questions, I'd like to now move into the pool testing uh, preview uh, for governing board consideration and uh, Mr. Tim Leiden um, from Concentric. Ms. Shaw. Yes. Before we uh, go to um, Ms. Leiden, there was one last slide, I think, before um, Ms. Leinhart, Leinhart um, stopped. And that was about the vaccine clinics. And I do want to thank the district for putting together some additional vaccine clinics. Um, at uh, our schools. And I think that's great to have other opportunities to get uh, folks vaccinated. So please, if you're not vaccinated out there, um, these are some other opportunities. Uh, one last opportunity on the 28th. Awesome. Right, yeah. We do have a couple more. I know there are a few other schools that are looking at dates, mm -hmm. uh, but we're just working, it just takes time to work through what works with Pima County and then the school staff to be able to support it. So we'll keep adding them as they become available. This is great. Yeah, and Ms. Shaw, I know that there are a couple of schools that are looking at a second, like um, Choya, you know, as the timing comes up, that they'd like that second, um, the, the clinic for the second dose. And so um, the other thing that I think is going to be really helpful is when we're able to vaccinate our younger students coming up with a really quick and easy way for our parents to be able to do that for, the, for children. And um, Ms. Leinhardt, is there, um, I'm sorry, Michelle, is there a way to um, not necessarily track, but like how many families have shown up on those dates? Um, I believe Pima County has that information. We have not, or I personally haven't received it, but I can certainly reach out to them and see if they have a listing because it's their team that is actually manning and providing the shots there. Okay, yeah, I'd, I'd like to know those numbers for the 24th meeting. Sure, we can certainly try and get that for you. Thank you. Absolutely. And uh, real quick before we move on, I just want to um, see if uh, Mr. Alvarez, if we can um, just reach out to the schools and just make sure that there are uh, tables available outside for learning before the, the 24th meeting, because I think, you know, that's a long time to wait to really kind of come secure, like, you know, much space outside. And if we could also communicate that, you know, some way for the students to know that these options are available. I think especially at the elementary level, you know, they need to kind of just follow the lead of all the students around them. So that if, if the teachers can communicate that with the people, that there are places to get outside, make sure that we have lunch tables outside. You know, it doesn't have to be like tables or anything, but we just a few.
Michelle, just so you know, you're cutting out some of it. I think some of the volume issues in terms of being only hear the last parts of your comment. Okay, I apologize. Um, did you hear most of it though? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Moving we'll on to um, the next part of this presentation. Thank, yes. thank you so much. I'd like to welcome Mr. Tim Leiden. Now, here we go. Our guest from Concentric. Concentric is the Arizona Department of Health Services contracted service provider uh, for classroom level testing for COVID-19. And of course, this service would be free of cost, not just a TUSD, but any district that opts to do it. And I believe our neighbors in Sunnyside uh, have, have opted for uh, pool testing. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Leiden. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Trujillo, uh, members of the governing board for and members of the district leadership for having me. Um, it's an honor. I, I promise that this is always my Zoom background. It's a little embarrassing that I'm here talking to you today with it, but i um, a <laughs> big fan of uh, Tucson Unified. Um, I just want to spend a couple minutes just laying out uh, the basics of what the, what the program is, um, and then would love to be able to answer any questions that, that anyone might have. Uh, next slide. So Concentric, which is a part of uh, Ginkgo Bioworks, which is a biotechnology company that um, is based out of Boston, has been testing in schools since fall of 2020. Um, and we developed a pooling protocol uh, ba that's based on a PCR testing model, uh, specifically to, uh, to be able to expand testing uh, to every classroom in, in the United States if, if they choose to, to have it. That was kind of the, the, the scale that we were trying to develop. We have uh, statewide programs. Um, this is now an outdated slide. We have statewide programs, of course, in Arizona, but also Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and now uh, California, Pennsylvania, Maryland, uh, North Carolina, and um, Connecticut. So uh, there are nine states where we've partnered with the Department of Health, the State Department of Health, and are testing um, across the state. And we're fortunate enough to be able to partner with ADHS uh, to bring what is kind of a, a, a national concept, but a very localized version of that in Arizona, uh, which we'll talk about. Next slide, please. Uh, just a couple, a couple snapshots um, of some of the programs we've been testing in Massachusetts since January, um, and actually we've been testing in Madison Elementary. They were part of our pilot program in February, so we've been testing with Superintendent Baca and Madison Elementary since uh, since February. Um, also uh, in Maine, Maryland, and many other places. Next slide. So just a, a quick rundown of the agenda, and I'll try to make this as brief as possible. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, so pooled testing is a highly scalable uh, version of classroom testing that's very well suited to K through 12 education settings. Um, it, it's intended to test cohorts, take many samples, put them in one tube, Tube, test that tube. Um, uh, it's highly efficient and it's uh, less resource intensive. It protects students' privacy. Um, and we'll talk about some of the, the, the basics of this, but it's a way to scale testing uh, across a very big district uh, like Tucson Unified is. Next slide. Um, it's affordable. When we first developed this back in November of last year, uh, there wasn't um, $10 billion. Uh, from the American Recovery Act that was then distributed to states specifically to fund uh, K-12 testing. Uh, that didn't exist, so we were trying to create a highly, a very affordable program uh, that, that could scale quickly. It's simple. Um, collection takes uh, five to ten minutes per classroom. It's a lower nasal swab, uh, four times in each nostril. Uh, you put the, the swabs upside down in the tube. And, uh, and then you test that one tube. Uh, it gives you peace of mind. The school and the district ha and the state have uh, great public health information um, about uh, how the virus may or may not be spreading in their school community. Uh, certainly masks uh, in, in the classroom is another very strong mitigation strategy. So this testing in this case is one of several mitigation strategies that taken together 
can give uh, kind of the, the broadest protection to school communities. And the goal of the program is really simple. It's to keep kids in classrooms and keep COVID out of classrooms and to understand when that dynamic is changing. Um, and it's empowering. We found that the students really like to test. Uh, they feel like they're taking control of something. They think it's kind of funny, especially the younger kids. Uh, they have had a lot of feelings of helplessness over the last 18 months. And this is some a proactive step that they can take and they can control. And we teach them about the science that underlies the PCR test and how you can detect COVID molecularly. Um, and so it's been actually a, a, a great boon for kind of science education as well. Next slide. And overall, it just instills confidence for a relatively small investment um, per classroom of time. Um, uh, you get a big benefit of public health information and also a sense of confidence, especially when, when looking around at variants like Delta that are highly contagious and more contagious in children than previous variants we've seen. Next slide. Yep, next slide, please. So the, the idea is pretty simple. Um, uh, you can put between five and 25 samples in one tube. That usually covers the number of consented students in a classroom. It's really important because this is an optional program for parents. Uh, not only is it optional, Arizona is making this program available. So it's optional for every school. It's optional for every district. Um, and then at the parent level, it's also completely voluntary. If a parent doesn't want their child, or a parent or guardian doesn't want their child to participate, they don't have to participate. Uh, if you can, if you can get to at least either four students that are consented, if the teacher in that classroom wants to be part of the pool, um, then you can test that classroom. You've reached the minimum threshold. If you only have two students consented in a classroom, you could always move them into another classroom and they can participate in testing as well. Um, if somehow you have over 25 consented students in one classroom, you just split that into two cohorts and you test uh, you know, 12 and, 12 and 13 or 12, 13 and 13. Um, it's all of the information, the student personal health, personal identifiable information and, and personal health information is maintained at the school for all pooled testing. Uh, we don't collect that uh, as a company. It's not inputted into our portal. It's kept at the school. We have different type of spreadsheet templates uh, that keep track of the students that are in each uh, pool. Uh, each classroom or cohort pool. And usually it's the consented students for a particular classroom that are present on the day of testing. Um, if there is a, if the, if the test result is negative, no further action, everyone in that pool is presumed negative. If the test result is positive, which we have seen on average about 1% of the time, not 1% prevalence, but 1% positivity rate across um, over 100,000 at this point uh, pooled samples and almost a million student noses swabbed. Uh, if the test is positive, then the next morning um, you can either retest that same classroom with uh, Abbott by Next Now, or you can do an individual PCR. Uh, that's called a reflex test. And that's where you go from knowing that there's a positive in that classroom to knowing who in the classroom is positive. Uh, we're in a great position in Arizona because we have an amazing lab partner in Sonora Quest. Sonora Quest, uh, which has done over 4 million COVID tests, the most in the state over the past 18 months, runs every single one of our samples. And we also critically get to use their courier network. Uh, they come down, they, they will pick up all the samples for all the schools in Pima County that are participating, as well as anywhere else except for a few far-flung areas where it just doesn't make sense to courier and they courier them right back up to uh to their big lab in uh in phoenix um and we have been seeing uh average results time average turnaround time results back by between 10 and midnight the night of collection uh, certainly before the next morning which allows for very prompt reflex testing um, you can you can really test uh, uh, if you chose to test using Binex now, which are provided by the county. We work closely with the Pima County Health uh, 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 Group, 
um, to get the tests from from them and bring them on site. Um, that's another part of the program that's really critical is that we provide on-site support uh, both to manage uh, test day collection um, and also to help organize the program overall. A key design principle of this and, and feedback we got from the very beginning is that teachers and administrators, they can't have one more thing on their plate. This would be the straw that would break the proverbial camel's back. And they've already had to take on so much more in the age of COVID that we had to design a program that did not put any additional work on them. So we did, and we're very fortunate uh, to have in Arizona as a partner that they are willing to fund um, the on-site support as well. Uh, one of the design principles I said, when you, when you have 25 students in a, in a pool and you test it once, uh, it's a lot less expensive than testing 25 individual students. It's a lot faster than testing 25 individual students. It's a lot more secure and private than testing 25 individual students. We take a lot of the savings from testing at scale in, two, in pools, and we put that, we reinvest that back into the on-site support. And so if, uh, if you're testing, let's say on a Monday, and you're a large school in Tucson, Tucson Unified, we might send two or three or more uh, folks on site to help coordinate a test with a school that might have you know 40 or 50 classrooms that are testing in a day and then the next day we don't wait to see if there's a positive pool we assume that there will be a positive pool and we send or or, or not assume we just in case we send on-site support the day after testing just in case there's a positive pool so that as quickly as possible in the morning you can, you can do the reflex testing, and so you know within 24 hours of the original test collection what the, uh, uh, what the outcome is, and you, you've been, been able to go um, from a classroom where you didn't really have any visibility into what was going on to an individual student or maybe two uh, that you've confirmed positive with a follow-up individual test. Um, kind of got hung up on this slide, so I'll go next slide. So this is just an illustration of how you can uh, quickly move from having uh, you know, one, one incidence or one person who might be positive in a student population, and very quickly in 24 hours, you can definitively know who it is. Next slide. Uh, it's, it, it is fast and easy. I, I usually leading up to the first test day, there's a bit of unknown, some consternation. There's an extensive onboarding process that we, uh, that we uh, uh, make available. Um, and then, of course, on test day, we have uh, on-site support. These are, these are local certified clinicians. They're RNs and LPNs, people with a certified medical background who pass all of the background checks and fingerprint, uh, everything you need to be able to go into a school and operate per Arizona uh, statute. And they will come on site and manage um, all collection and it, it, it starts out by maybe the first week, it takes 10 to 15 minutes per, in a classroom. And by week two or three, it's taking five minutes. The kids all have it down. It, it's pretty, pretty quick and easy. Uh, one of the reasons it's so quick is that you don't have to take all the individual student information and put it into the portal and document it for every single student. That's required if you were testing individual students as opposed to starting with a pooled test. And that also, like I said, protects privacy. So all of the, the only time that uh, uh, we would ever know or the public health authority would ever know individual information on a student is if they were part of a positive pool and therefore had to have a follow-up test. And that's a requirement from a public health perspective so that you uh, can conduct public health reporting and you can alert that, that uh, student and their parents um, uh, and the school community that, that, is, that they are, have tested positive. Next slide. Perfect. So a couple components of this, I talked about the pooled testing, which is the foundational weekly testing only for students who, uh, uh, whose parent or guardian consents, or if they're 18 in high school, they, they themselves consent. Um, the individual diagnostic follow-up tests, two options that the district or the school can decide. Um, uh, the Arizona Department of Health uh, is, is recommending Binex now uh, just because it, you you know faster because you'll know that next morning 
um, exactly who's positive. The PCR is, is another great option, um, the gold standard for testing. Then the staffing support, both administrative and medical professional on-site staffing support, as well as uh, you know, a phone and, um, and email support for answering quick questions, kind of a Zendesk um, uh, quick question turnaround. And then we, do, we take care of all the reporting, um, both at the district and the state level. So it's kind of, uh, you don't have to worry about, we, we manage and, 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 and kind of do all the reporting. Next slide. Just very quickly, uh, it, since we have a contract with the state, um, we don't have to contract with individual districts or schools. Um, we're very happy to share the terms of the contract with the state so you can see that we're covered on insurance and uh, background checks and all the things that you would be thinking about um, uh, as the leadership of such a large um, district. Um, so really what we do is, is uh, talk you through the program. Um, if a district or school chooses to sign up, um, then uh, we have a kind of a pretty quick onboarding. We can usually test um, within two weeks of it kicking off that onboarding process. And the long pole in that tent is finding, uh, is, is, is uh, uh, getting the staffing support and connecting them to the schools where they'll be working. And that same staffing support person or people go back to the same school every week. So there's continuity um, between, between those, uh, those folks. And on test day, um, you'll have on-site support that comes on site, manages all the supplies, passes out uh, um, uh, tubes to all the classrooms, observes. Uh, in the case of middle and high school, where you have perhaps only a short homeroom period uh, at the front of, of the morning, um, and so you have a, a very short window to test across many, many classrooms, we'll send a couple of on-site support folks and then we'll need a little help uh, uh, from the school, uh, just to really the teachers, just to make sure they set aside the sample so that when the on-site support people can come around the classroom, they can collect everything and take care of everything. They box it up uh, and they hand it to the, the courier from Sonora Quest and that's it. The next day, if there's a positive pool, they'll be on site. They will bring by next now tests. They have a CLIA certificate of waiver. You don't have to worry about that. And we can do the, the follow-up testing. Next slide. Just a quick snapshot of, of everything that's provided in, we, we overnight ship um, uh, the testing kits so that uh, you have, and really it's the on-site support person, has everything they need to manage the program on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide. The big, the, the place where we need the most partnership is certainly on um, um, trying to get consents. Uh, we have uh, a digital consent, um, so it's something that you can email out to all parents. It is automatic, so you can just click on it, and then a parent can go through and provide their consent. It's, we only have a version in English, but our consent has been translated into 27 different languages. So there's always a mix of digital consent and paper consent. And then the paper consent you can send home with the student. Um, you could, if they're going to, we talked a little bit earlier about potential for um, convening uh, for the on-site uh, when parents come to the school. If any of that's happening, that's a good time to get consent. But we can work with individual schools to try and um, uh, help uh, uh, both promulgate and, and collect consents. Um, uh, but as long as you can get four or five students for a classroom, it makes sense to test that classroom. We have a study that says, even if there's only 10 to 15% participation in such a close cohort, you're still uh, uh, kind of picking up over time the viral load in that, um, in that classroom. Next slide. Just a little more on, on test day, we'll keep going. Uh, what happens with positive pools, um, I kind of jumped the gun on that. Um, but essentially, uh, you can either choose uh, next morning, uh, or, uh, by next now, um, or uh, lab-based PCR, which is Sonora Quest's uh, Perkin Elmer PCR. And, and the upper box is, uh, is, is really what, what ADHS is, is strongly, strongly recommending um, to keep kids in class. Ms. Shaw? 
Um, yeah. who's, who's doing the Binax now testing? You said Sonora Quest is doing the, the other, or did I misunderstand? Right, so um, uh, the Binax now will happen on site. Uh, so uh, the county um, will provide the actual test kits and the test will be conducted by our, uh, it's, a, it's a local company called Spartan Medical, or it's a company in Arizona that has a very big footprint in Arizona. And they, they find and train um, certified health professionals. They train them up to make sure they know how to, how to conduct a Binex Now uh, test. And they would come on site with the kits and, uh, and they would uh, conduct the test. And the te it all happens within 15 minutes. And then they would put the results in our online portal. Whereas the, the pooled test and the PCR tests, if they're chosen, those physically go to Sonora Quest Lab and Sonora Quest does all the processing and then puts the results in the portal. Okay, so the staff member that you hire is yes. gonna come on to campus and then they need a space to work or, I mean, do we need to coordinate that? So you have like a section, okay. I just wanted to understand that one because I, I, I didn't quite, okay, thank you. I have sure. a few questions about this slide too. Um, so the, sure. the follow-up testing is not pool. This is individual testing for everyone who's consented in that classroom that has a positive? Who was in the previous day's pool, yes, okay. doctor. So the individual testing. Individual testing. Okay, and this is only for people who've consented for the, for the first testing. So there's no way for parents to know from like, who haven't consented that someone tested no. positive in their pool. No, doctor. Another question, on the high school and junior high level, when people are going to multiple classrooms, how do we figure out which pool? They so typically, in? great question. So uh, typically if they don't have a homeroom period or sometimes if they do have a homeroom period that's very short, uh, they will just designate the first, um, say you're testing on Monday, whatever their first period class is on Monday, that's their testing. And you test, you always keep the same day of the week for testing, so wherever, Johnny is um, on Monday first period, he's in geography, he'll always get tested in geography if he's consented. And then it would be our on-site support people that would keep track of all of, all of those cohorts. We have a, a pretty sophisticated Excel template um, wh where we can kind of like just rinse and repeat week to week to make sure that we're keeping track of the cohorts and making sure that they are, uh, and anyone who is participating in the pooling is um, consented. Mr. Leiden? Yes. I'm wondering if parents um, have to consent every week or do they consent once and it's for the entire school year? Great question. Uh, they consent once for the entire school year. It's a global consent. So they're consenting both for the pooled testing and if necessary, for the follow-up individual testing that would only be triggered if, there, if their student was part of a positive pool. And that only happens one time. Okay, and so if, uh, like, for say my daughter's class was pulled and then she had to get an individual test, um, are the parents going to be notified prior to that, or is it just going to like happen? You know what I mean? Yes, great question. Um, in Arizona, because Sonora Quest is, uh, to be honest, it's like this is the best case scenario of everywhere we're working because essentially Sonora Quest is really like three hours away from the vast majority of the population centers where uh, schools are, are testing. Um, you're getting results back so quickly that by the, I mean, the, so, so a, a, let's say a, a principal or assistant principal wakes up, uh, they have, they, they tested 30 classrooms the day before, um, one was positive, they, they would get an email you both can go into your into our portal. It's just a login like any any other portal, and see all the results. But if you have a positive, you'll get an email. So they get the email seven o'clock. Uh, by the time they would even have a communication to parents, you already can do the by next now follow up. So most schools and districts are electing to just wait the hour or two till you know with certainty who uh, who was the positive within the pool, and then you can take kind of the same types of actions you would have taken last year um, or are considering taking this year around contact tracing and quarantine. And it sounds like that that's a, a separate thing that sometimes is in collaboration with uh, the county. Um, 
But in terms of in terms of that 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 reflex testing, we call it, just happens, and it we we endeavor to enable it to happen as quickly as possible the next day. Thank you. No problem. Um, next slide. I'm I'm getting very close to the end. I promise. This just show this is just shows that across. I'm just going to reiterate, and we're in Delta now. Delta is more contagious in children. It's a whole new world. In most of Arizona, we aren't going to have masks guaranteed in schools. So we don't know exactly how many positive pools, what the positivity rate is going to be. Um, I will say uh, on average across 20 states, urban, rural, all kinds of different ethnic and socioeconomic conditions, we averaged 1% positivity rate. So a positive pool was by far the exception and not the rule. Just for an example of something we may see in some places um, in either Tucson or broader Arizona was what we experienced in Baltimore City uh, in March when they came back to school after having been out of school for a year uh, in person, like many places were. And all the students came back at once across something like 100 schools and they started testing. Again, that was voluntary. You could you didn't have to consent, but every school in the in the district participated in testing. And so that was kind of a baseline. Um, it was the first week back, 8% positivity rate. There was news articles written about it because it was higher than expected. They stuck with it. Next week, it was four. Week after that, it was two and a half. And by the fourth week, it was 2%. And that's where it maintained for the rest of the semester. And they're testing with us again in the fall. And so the part of it is the regularity of the testing that you continue to test and you pull out the positives uh, on, on a routine basis um, uh, will get you to an equilibrium. Um, but but even then, with that the spike in Baltimore City, overall, across all the different places we've tested in over 1,000 schools, it's been an average of 1%. Next slide. So just I'll just speak to we have all kinds of resources for schools, for parent communities. Our website has been translated into 120 languages. We have certain sections that are answer parents questions. We have coloring books and you can keep kind of just quickly going through these slides about every three, four seconds. Different materials, training videos, webinars, uh, checklists comic books, coloring sheets, different ways to engage different stakeholders. We have a, a frequently asked questions for parents. We have blog posts where we take a, a kind of some of the toughest questions. What are you doing with my child's data? Are you, are you mapping their DNA and things like that? And we turn those into blog posts and we post them on the website. And sometimes schools ch choose to send those out if they know that a particular question is going to come up. Um, so we really try to meet the community where it is. And, and there's no, nothing is is, is everything is transparent and, and we really try to answer uh, questions um, uh, as because because parents definitely have great questions ar around this. I guess I would end with kind of where we are in Arizona. So right now we have 12 districts and a bunch of charter and, and private schools signed up. So we have Cartwright, um, Sunnyside, uh, Alhambra, Madison, Roosevelt, Osborne, Phoenix Elementary, Fowler, um, and, and several other districts that are uh, testing, uh, either are testing or preparing to test district-wide this fall, um, and a bunch of others that are, uh, are, are kind of close to making, uh, to joining. Um, and, uh, and, and so we, we think we're, so overall it's coming up on, it's well over 150 schools that are gonna be participating. Um, and we, we're, we're definitely, uh, there's definitely been renewed interest in the last three or four weeks. Um, so maybe with that, I will, I will, uh, I will thank you for your time. We can cut the presentation and happy to continue to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Leiden. Any other questions, board members? And, um, Ms. Shaw? Yes. Yeah, just to clarify, this is a voluntary additional testing that parents can sign their children up for, or if old enough, students can sign themselves up for if they're 18 and older, that um, 
someone outside of the district will go in. They've been approved through state contract. They're going to go in and allow, and the students test themselves, right? They swab themselves. It isn't something that someone else does. And so I just want to make sure that that's clear because I know for the adults that have been tested, that process can be um, pretty intense <laughs> depending on who's doing the swabbing. And so this will be your own. It's not identifying any individual child until there is a positive in that class. And it really just helps us to understand what is going on at that school, in that classroom, on that specific day, once a week, they get swabbed. And then um, if there is a positive, then notification is, happens pretty quickly. And then there's the option to test individual students in that class. In a yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. The cost to the district is Zero. Big, don oh. big donut. And and what we, uh, some critical clarifications there that I'm glad you made. Um, it is a lower nasal swab. It's called an interior nares. It's the lowest, most shallow swab. It is not a nasal pharyngeal that requires another person to really get it up there. It is uh, self swab down to kindergarten. Um, and we've never had uh, an issue with the students being able to swab. The only time we have uh, that schools have requested assistance in swabbing is with certain um, s uh, children with special needs because um, we we have have definitely worked with them and and that's at the school's request uh, that it's that that's a, a very rare that's kind of an outlier case it's and it's completely voluntary and in fact every parent or guardian has to opt in uh, in order for them to be included in the program. Okay, and then one other thing, you mentioned some of the other districts. Is TUSD going to be the largest district that you've been working with in Arizona? Uh, the largest district in Arizona, but not the largest district uh, in the country. Um, so we've tested district-wide in, in um, Newark, in uh, uh, Milwaukee, in Montgomery County, which I think has 230 schools. Um, uh, or maybe it's 130 schools and 200,000 students. It's a lot. So w this would be among, this would be probably in the top 10 size districts that we've worked with in the country, but um, uh, uh, not the largest. Okay. And then one other last question. So um, you said that it would take about two weeks from the time that we vote to the time that we ramp up. If for whatever reason, there's any delays, um, have you in previous districts started with certain schools and then expanded it. And so my thought would be if we work with the Pima County Health Department to really identify the schools that are in really high, even though the entire county now is considered high transmission, perhaps targeting some of those neighborhoods that are really high transmission, but also low vaccine, that maybe that would be a combination. Because I know um, healthcare employees in general, um, there is a shortage just like in a lot of other service, healthcare service um, related. For sure, and we would take our cues from from district leadership, from school board leadership on how you wanna ramp over what period of time, starting with what tranches of schools, that's completely your decision. And we're here to just be, uh, uh, to support whatever ramp um, you would like. Like I talked about in Montgomery County with so many schools um, and students, they added, uh, they weren't, it took them four weeks to get up to, to kind of like full, what their program was full capacity. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to suggest that in case there is um, the need, I'm sure the parents in, in our schools that would like to have their child tested would like that to happen at all of our schools because, you know, but I just wanted to, to throw that out as an option. Thanks. Thank you. Michelle. Uh, I had two questions. Um, first of all, I was a little confused on slide 21 on that 80% of positive individuals with a pool are identified with rapid antigen tests on first pass. That means there's a like an 80% uh, positive predictive value on this test that 20% um, of the positives in a pool will result in no positives um, when we test it in each individual in the pool. Uh, or what am I understanding from from this? Yeah, if if you're that's exactly right. So if you um, uh, if you are using Binex now as a reflex, um, uh, a, a systematic study of in a school setting in the Northeast, I'm happy to, to, to pass along the study, found that in 80% of positive pools, 
where Binex was used as a reflex, in 80% of the time, you find the positive pool. So in 20% of the time, there's no positive, even though there was a positive pool within the, with, with those same students within the last uh, few days. That might have been two days ago. And kind of the variant there is, you know, viral load is changing for the students. I mean, I'm speaking to a physician, but viral load is changing in the, in, in, in most cases, there's usually two days in between, not just 24 hours in between pool test and reflex test. Um, and also, obviously, the sensitivity of uh, a Binex is n not quite on par with the underlying PCR test that was the pool. So that's what accounts for 20% for 20 percent of the follow-up tests not finding a positive. And ADHS's approach um, is to is that uh, essentially you then want to stay on kind of like looking for symptoms and you're already going to be testing that classroom again in the next kind of five days. Um, uh, you can also do a second Binex or you can do a follow up PCR. So there's, there's even options beyond um, just the following. But that you, you did you did interpret that. My understanding is you interpret that correctly, that in 20 in, in, a, in a study, 80 uh, percent of the time, a, a, a positive individual was identified in a positive pool when using Binex as a reflex. And my second question, I think you mentioned um, during the presentation that one of the goals is to you know, identify these cases and keep, what do you think you mentioned keeping classrooms open and, and you know, throughout, like, not that I'm saying we don't want to know when there's positive COVID cases, but I, I would imagine that if we're, we're testing more frequently and we find a lot more of the asymptomatic carriers, uh, that we're going to have to close down, you know, and quarantine more kids and close down more classrooms. And so that's my only hesitation on this, especially if you know, we're requiring masks and that's our mitigation strategy to find all these asymptomatic carriers um, when they're not going to be spread it because of increased mask usage that we're going to be just now having more kids in quarantine and more and more classes closed and, and more problems to deal with. Well, it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a great point and it, it does depend on how, um, how you want to contact trace in quarantine. Um, the same, if, if, if you do get, catch someone who's asymptomatic um, but has been wearing a mask, pulling them out may not result, need to result in pulling out close associates. Um, that's, a, that's obviously a policy decision. Um, the idea in the program is that um, uh, th th this is additional information that will allow districts and schools to make decisions. Um, and, uh, and, and other schools, not just in Arizona, but in other places have found that they'd rather have more information rather than less, um, uh, when it comes to, when it comes to this, but that's a, that's a, a strong point. Any other questions? Um, I have a quick question, Ms. Shaw. Go ahead. Hi, Mr. Leiden. Um, so my, and, and maybe this is also Dr. Trujillo question. As I'm, I'm still, re as I'm got the slides up over here on my other com um, screen, I just want to um, make sure that um, staff and uh, teachers are also can participate. Yes, gr great question. So um, they definitely can, and we encourage them to. There was a bunch of discussion pre Delta about whether vaccinated teachers. Uh, about whether to, to, to encourage and or include vaccinated teachers and staff in the pools. And now with the way that uh, uh, Delta's transmission profile, let's say, um, most, most of the schools we were testing are really encouraging and, and hoping that vaccinated adults uh, join with the pools, especially the teachers that are in the cohort, the classroom cohort setting. Um, so they're not only are they eligible to participate? It, many schools are, uh, like mo actually most district offices are also a, a school or a test site and they're testing their administrative staff in pools just like as if they were a school. And likewise, uh, schools are often testing maintenance staff, administrative staff, other school staff um, that, that aren't in classrooms every single day. They're testing them um, in pools as well. Uh, totally optional, but certainly part of the program. 
Okay, and then I guess my second part to that question, and maybe that's a Dr. Trujillo answer, um, that there's gonna be um, staff strictly from the company to dedicate to this, so we're not gonna be making our teachers be also a health aid, because they already have too much on their plate. So I just wanna make sure that, that the community knows what the teacher's role in this would be in the classroom. Yeah, uh, board member Luna Rose, that, that's what makes this, uh, you know, an item for consideration. Um, one of the things that early on in the presentation I received with Tim and his group that was attractive was the fact that it didn't require additional staffing on our end. Uh, we don't know at what point that the Pima County Health Department's gonna be overrun with contract contact tracing. At some point they will be with all the K-12 districts coming back uh, last week and this week. And so we're gonna need every available resource to I think inevitably pick up that responsibility. And so we're just, we just don't have the resources to do it. Uh, to Dr. Gravois Shah's point, my urgency around this was definitely stronger before the universal mask mandate. Do I think we could still use it? Yes, but I would prefer more of a slow rollout um, you know, to be able to kind of try it out and test it in selected schools. My concerns are around high school and the difficulty logistically of being able to do that. Not every high school in the district has an established sort of first period homeroom, which, which would make that very, very logistically difficult. Um, I think that's, that's kind of our, our primary concern right now. But I do think, secondly, I would like time to really kind of jump into this with principals and get them involved and kind of troubleshoot it a little bit more, especially at some of those big schools. You know, we have huge K-8s, we have big elementaries who this might not be as easy for as some, one of our smaller schools. So I think for me, as I kind of hear the conversation and as I kind of take a look at where we are now with a mask mandate, I would actually more look at a pilot um, and take a small set of schools to try to try this out with and make it comfortable, replicate it at a larger scale. And, and that's something that we're happy to support and it's something that a lot of larger districts have done. Um, so we would take our cues uh, uh, from you and, and are, are happy to support um, in any way. Ms. Shaw. Dr. Who are you looking for then board action on this item if we were to move forward with, um, with the pool testing in our schools? Yes, definitely uh, board action, but if the board didn't want action, I would take formal direction as well. And Ms. Shaw, uh, my request before we take action this item, I'd love to hear from Ms. Stefan. I'd like to put this uh, in context of what's gonna happen when we have positives in our classrooms uh, before I make a decision on the pool testing. I know that was gonna be part of her presentation you said earlier. Nikki, are you on? I certainly am. Okay. Um, so I think we were gonna start at this time with um, Jean showing our dashboard for TUSD. So um, this was for last week. So our, our students were um, truly only in school for two days, all of the students and all the staff for two days. And if you just look at the top line, it is pretty much the, the best way to see. We had um, 16 positive cases last week um, for students and nine positive for staff. And that definitely was an increase to what we were experiencing this summer, as we suspected. And of course, um, I can talk about uh, how we handle those cases because it sounds like that's um, a big interest right now. I do not have the um, instructions in front of me, the protocol, the standards, but they are um, out there and I'm, I'm more than willing to provide but I can tell you basically what happens in a school. So a child is sick or a staff member is sick. They come to the health office. We make sure they're isolated and we offer them a test. And if they have COVID-like symptoms. So if they had an earache, we probably 
would not put that in the category of COVID-like symptoms. But if they did, then we would, we would offer them a test. If it's a staff member, the staff member would do it. If it's a, a student, we would get permission from the parent. They can say yes, they can say no. Um, most are saying yes. If they are positive at that time is when we remove them from the school and we instruct them that they um, need to take the next 10 days in isolation. And it's pretty cut and dry. We have a great um, handout to give them that we've made about close contacts, the CDC. It's called our reference guide. We've updated it as, as the months have gone on and we just think it's dynamite. Also gives a phone number for Pima County Health Department, talks about the rules of quarantine. And so that's what goes on for the person, the child that's positive. So if we have a child that turns is negative, but they're sick, the rule will be they still have to go home. And then they can come on back to school when they're, if they have a negative test, when they're feeling better. And we figure that's 20, at least 24 hours, fever free, um, symptoms have subsided. So those are our standards. If we have a parent tell us um, Jimmy tested positive for COVID, um, same goes. We, um, we do the same process we do for any other child. We mark them as a COVID um, isolation in our computer. We know they need to be out for 10 days. We notify Pima County. It's quite extensive how we notify them. Um, the information that they require is the name of the student, the name of the parent, the birth date. They can't do anything without the birth date, the phone number, when they were um, had their positive COVID test. So that's the paper that, we're, that we are required to do within 24 hours. I'm going to tell you we do that within an hour or two. We're, we're very quick on finding the, ISO, the, the child that is positive. It's a little more tricky for our staff, and this is a group process, where health assistants, nurses, and the administrator come together, and we ask the COVID positive person who they've come in close contact with. Obviously, if it's a child, they, a young child, they're probably not going to be able to. So then we ask the teacher, and they identify the six feet the, with the mask for greater than 15 minutes. And then we identify those students and our next responsibility is to also report all of those students to Pima County Health Department. It's on a Qualtrics report. That goes straight to their contracted agency and that's where they take it up and they start calling families um, that, had, that were close contact, figure out if they need to quarantine, if they're vaccinated, they may not need to quarantine. That's in the hands of Pima County Health Department per Dr. Cullen. And she's made that real clear. That is um, their job. To, and To Ms. Stefan, so that's the staff members who, who then they self-report the students or whoever else they were in contact with. And this is without a mask, less than six feet, 15 minutes. So they had a mask on the entire time and they wouldn't report anybody. It's with or without a mask. Okay. It, you still have to um, do the quarantine or isolation. Okay. Is is how the um, how they've defined it. Okay, so, so less than six feet for fifteen minutes or more. Okay. But um, Dr. Rafi, so so that's how we handle every case we get, and from there, then Pima County takes it or gives us direction. Today we had a situation where we did have an outbreak and Dr. Cullen was involved along with epidemiology. They made the decisions and instructed us in, uh, of how to handle the situation. And there was uh, quite a few students that were quarantined per Pima County Health Department. And they actually had a letter that we sent out to that, that specific population. Um, we do send out a letter to families if there is a positive case in a school. So it, it's, it's kind of a generic letter, but basically it says, we've had a positive case in a school. It does not mean your child is uh, 
been exposed or a close contact, but we want you to know about this. And I'm certainly willing to share those with you. It, um, when we have an outbreak, Pima County puts out their letters and puts words into it uh, and specifics of when they want students to come back or not. Um, let's see what else. Can you speak, uh, Ms. Stefan, about like the, when we hear stories of other school districts and this classroom got closed and other, other issues there, uh, what, oh. what, what leads to closing an entire classroom or closing an entire school? Or what, what would lead to those decisions? So at this time, Doctor, it's not written, but I can tell you what I've been told. Okay, so in an in a individual classroom, it's three or greater. Um, it, it, to um, qualify as a, a, a close a classroom. But they look at other factors as well, how much physical distancing was going on. Obviously, if it's a classroom where most of the kids are vaccinated, they may think differently, but that's why they're involved in, in that kind of um, situation. We do not close down classrooms, only Pima County. And if you're talking about an entire school, it goes with the, um, the typical, typical communicable disease, and that's 10% of the population. So that could be 10% of a group that was together all day, uh, a baseball team, something like that, or 10% of the entire school, if they were positive, then that would be a, um, I, I would not say, from my point of view, that would be a shutdown, but that would be the responsibility of Pima County to take on that. Um, and instruct us how they want to handle that situation. At this time, we have um, one outbreak. And so we, we haven't run into that situation um, for an entire school or an entire classroom at this time. Um, I can um, give you the numbers because of course we're all curious. This exact chart, our, our dashboard, so we fill out paperwork for Pima County. And since the beginning of time, we've also taken reports for our students and staff. And then it pops up here on the dashboard. I wanna say it's a one-time deal. So every Monday, anyone who has been identified as COVID positive, they'll come up on this. And then when their 10 days are up and they're no longer COVID positive, they'll drop off it. So a person could actually be on um, the dashboard for two weeks because it's 10 days. So oftentimes they're there for two weeks. Um, but uh, as far as cases are going, uh, naturally they are increasing from last week. Um, we, had, um, we had a bad day yesterday. We had 16 positive cases and today we had eight. And this is at various schools and um, the protocol that I just talked about where health staff and the administrator get together. We do all the reports. We notify to Pima County. We send out a letter to the parents. That is our standard. And then if parents call us, we don't go directly to them, but if they call us and say, hey, was my child a close contact? I'm really worried. If they ask that directly, I, we will say, yes, your child was identified as a close contact. And then if they pursue further, I give them the four column form um, about the guidelines of what they should do as far as CDC instructions and Pima County instructions will be, because it takes a couple days for Pima County to get involved. We wish it was much quicker. If I can, um, I will say that we support a limited pilot and rollout in a handful of schools. Uh, we would like an opportunity to work with principals to kind of troubleshoot uh, any potential logistical or implementation issues. And we'd like to make them a part of the planning process. 
Uh, in, in accordance with what Mrs. Grijalva noted, I do want to select pilot schools in high impact zip code areas where we do have lower vaccination rates and higher transmission rates. I think those are natural spots to take a look at some pilots to have an immediate impact. Uh, that would allow us to kind of really work through any potential large scale uh, logistical issues that could affect us a little bit later on. Just as you saw with the numbers today, what we saw with bail, this is, I believe, going to really, in, it, I don't know if it's going to be in a few weeks or it's going to be a month. I, I'm not sure that with the sheer amount of K-12 students coming back into classrooms, that Pima County is going to continue to be able to handle 100% of all the contact tracing. I think inevitably it's going to somehow in some way, shape or form, even a part of it may be returned to local, local schools. And I think with that kind of looking down the road, I do like the fact that Concentric does provide 100% of the staffing uh, to be able to come in and handle this. So with that, I'm, I'm comfortable with consideration of a pilot. Uh, that we can uh, take a look at. And so, um, I'm sorry, Michelle. So your specific recommendation, Dr. Trujillo, is do you have a number of schools? Do you have a percentage? Do you want to, I mean, yep. when, when I talk to the motion, uh, when I talk to the administration, we wanted to start with anywhere between 10 and 15, um, really, really small scale. Uh, take a look at some elementaries, a middle, go K-8, and maybe try to take a look at a high school to see what that could look like. We, of course, would try to select one that had some sort of advisory hour. Uh, that's probably the only way it's going to work. Uh, and then really meet with those principals and, and, and hammer out the logistics and, and see what could be done on a larger scale. And, of course, we would center the selection off of zip code data. Uh, taking a look at those zip codes that have the lowest vaccination rates and the highest rates of transmission. And again, my, my decision here, my recommendation pre-governing board action to institute universal masking would have been different. If this is pre-universal masking, I'm talking larger scale, not a pilot. I'm talking actually rollout. Let's do waves of rollout, you know, sort of 20-20-20. But now with universal masking in play, uh, I'm, I'm more interested in, in the pilot uh, route. Ms. Shaw. Go ahead. So I'll um, make a motion to approve the pool testing uh, in a pilot scale uh, with the ability of administration to ramp up uh, as they see fit for the district. Yeah. Um, I'll second that, and I, I do, I would like to see us move towards more schools rather than less, because I think we also have to anticipate that we have a September date coming up, and um, we don't know what that's going to mean for our district. We have a, you know, some, some issues going on around our state regarding the mask mandates, and so I do, I'd, I'd like the capacity to be able to increase the number if there is the demand I, I do think that because this is a voluntary program that you have to opt in for um, i do think that we'll have more families and employees that quite frankly want to have additional um, layers of mitigation available to them personally um I am more in favor of us doing a district-wide testing. I think that, you know, with the, you know, students eating lunch inside and, you know, whatever happens when they leave school, um, you know, it's going to behoove us to get everybody on board to the testing now rather than in September. Um, and so I think we owe it to our community since we have this amazing program that's free of charge that we just go ahead and do the entire district now um, because that's the only way, uh, you know, district wide we can really protect our students on top of all the other mitigation strategies that we have in place. Ms. Shaw, I'm not opposed to district wide. I just thought that logistically it might be difficult to do just because, you know, we're kind of a bigger district um, here in Arizona, most of the time that we try to do district-wide things, it's 
it's hard staffing wise um, for every for anything we do. So if we're able to do bigger, I'm I'm comfortable with that. And I do think that this this motion allows for that to happen because it's like we start with the pilot and expand it. Maybe if we is there anything in uh, this motion's language that if we modified it, you'd be able to vote for this. Because I am concerned if we go from like nothing to in two weeks that we'll have schools. I just would hate for the expectation to be that it's going to be district wide when staffing might be the issue. Right, uh, Ms. Shaw. Go ahead. Um, I agree with you. Actually, I would like to see this district wide. Um, and, and, but I do understand the, the need for, or what the, the want of a pilot program. So if we go that route, can we pick, I, I know that Dr. Trujillo mentioned the, the areas that have higher numbers, but in order to make it fair, I mean, we've got, you know, um, lots of area to cover. So can we pick like quadrants of, if we're gonna go that route, as opposed to doing a district ride, like, like schools out in the Sabino area and down in, in Pueblo, and then you know, just kind of, we're we're kind of t taking the pulse of the district, doing it that way. Yeah, we can we can look at the different regions. There's zip codes of high transmission pretty much all over Pima County. I mean, we could pick two challenge zones in each region. Uh, I, I'm not opposed to a, a, a ramp up or going district wide, but my experience. Uh, both at the site level as a principal and as a district level leader and as a superintendent, when the resources, the training and the materials that you need to implement something district wide uh, aren't what you need them to be to match the size of your uh, initiative, you can very quickly overwhelm and frustrate teachers and principals. And I think doing it at, uh, you know, getting a 15 school sample allows us to get a great read on the exact level of resources, training, and support that are going to be your dinner? Up, up a little bit later. So that, that's where we're at versus going too far too fast. Uh, and the, and the, the initiative itself uh, requiring capacity that we're not able to provide at this moment creates a lot of frustration and anxiety with those that are trying to implement. So I think that's what the pilot idea allows us to do. My urgency around going district-wide faster somewhat is mitigated between now and September 29th, but that doesn't mean we don't need to game plan for post-September 29th. And I think the 15 school idea allows us to do that in a relatively quick way. And it's a great opportunity for us to involve campus principals in the planning process. Mr. Leiden, I wonder if if um, you and your team have, you know, onboarded large districts like ours um, in a in a short amount of time, and like what strategies you have. If there's like a, I don't know, like a large training type of thing that we can do with multiple schools, or or if there's any strategies available for that. Um, uh, thank you, Ms. Shaw. It's a great question. Um, member, members of the team have been on site for the last five weeks, both um, for on-site training uh, and also for um, uh, helping answer questions about school recruitment. Um, uh, I, I, I promise you that we will be very transparent if there, if we do see, see that there would be any bottlenecks such that the last thing we would want to do is raise expectations and then not be able to deliver on that commitment. Um, but I do think since we, we've been operating at kind of over a thousand schools continuously for the last, where there was a dip in the summer, but really since about May of this year, um, and onboard some pretty big districts in never longer than four weeks uh, that we could thread a needle that is between kind of uh, quickly getting a pilot cohort up and running with all kinds of preparation in the background for if and when you, uh, the, the leadership decides to really uh, expand beyond. That's a commitment we can make. We, the, the state is giving us a lot of resources to deploy, 
um, specifically because we have such a short time window across many, many districts um, to do this. So, uh, so, so one, I, I feel confident that we can work with you to, to, to kind of like find the, the, the middle ground between the discussion and, and two, we'll be very transparent um, along the way um, and, and put all our resources uh, against it. Thank you. Any other discussion on this? Ms. Shaw, in order to modify the motion, would it be essentially that we're in favor of poll testing and to work with the administration on the rollout with the goal being district-wide implementation? I don't know. We want to pick a date. Um, I don't know, end of September, or with regular updates provided to the board at every board meeting. I mean, I'm just trying to make sure that we craft something that everyone can support and kind of addresses the concerns. Mr. Leiden, when is the soonest you could get this? Oh, you said two weeks, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, I, I just, uh, if we're going to go district wide, I would prefer language that allows us to move at the speed of the organization. Uh, this is not something that I would advise telling principals, all 89, you need to do this and have it up and running in two weeks. Because even though you're, we're looking at Concentric providing all the resources, we've got professional development. We've got to find the time to be able to train everybody. We've got communication for families. We've got to create opt-in forms. We've got to get those forms. I can keep going, you know, and, and right now our principals are still just opening school. And I think I'd like to make them a part of this process and let them know what's involved versus kind of dropping it on school communities, which is why either a pilot or a slower rollout where we did 15 or 20 schools at a time in a slower ramp up until we got all of our 89 done across several weeks. Uh, okay. All of us, you know, we, we've been in Tucson Unified long enough to know that whatever the initiative is, when we drop things on people very quickly, it usually doesn't go very well. I've kind of been bitten by that snake, you know, <laughs> it, it, most recently with transportation. So I, I don't want to make that same mistake again with families, community, and schools. So, um, Ms. Shaw, can we say that we're going to do, we're implementing um, pool testing in Tucson Unified, that we're going to start with 20 schools and um, ask our administration to provide us updates as to how the implementation is going and a timeline? Because I think for the first 20, we'll have a better idea as to what the capacity will be. Thoughts? Um, I mean, we. I guess we could go that route, but I'm wondering if it would be better for the community if we say we will, we are going to do it district wide. Those schools who want to opt in to start immediately, we can do that. Like, I don't want to limit it to 20. Like, what if we have a lot of schools who are really um, interested in starting this as soon as possible and you know from what I've heard from Mr. Leiden is that like you know they have the resources and the capacity um, it's just really the training that is gonna uh, slow us down a bit. Yeah I'm just going with the recommendation of Dr. Trujillo in implementing district-wide in in our district district-wide initiatives and so I'm comfortable with Having a slower rollout, not something that is district right, wide right away, but the that the intention is to make it district wide. I don't know that we have to limit it to 20, but even if we just say a slower rollout, I don't know if that's specific enough for both you and Miss Luna Rose, who indicated they wanted something. I just want to make sure it's it's not it's seen as an asset and and a good thing in our district versus something that you know administration feels like they have to do in addition to you know we're only on the what fourth day of school so i'm just it's a timing thing yeah i don't 
I don't mind the language of the motion clearly saying the expectation is district wide. I don't, I don't have an issue with that. I think that's fine. Um, I think the slower rollout is what more I'm looking for, which basically accomplishes the same thing as a pilot. Um, for me, a slower rollout across several weeks allows us to assess available resources, time available for training, areas of further understanding, communication with parents, opt-in processes at every school. That, that's what I'm most concerned about right now. And then of course, what's on the principal's plates, they're still trying to get through the opening of schools. So for us, like right now, coming through a transportation issue, coming through a mask mandate, that's kind of put some additional responsibilities on teachers and, and, and principals. For us, it would be beneficial to kind of like, we don't have to limit it to 20, but have an opt-in group first. We can set a minimum at 20, but if more wanna go, the more the merrier so that we have this sort of coalition of the willing that says, hey, all right, we've done this, uh, brother and sister, uh, fellow principals, here's some stuff, here's some logistical items we need to look out for. So in the next implementation group of 20 or 30, we can address any areas or shortcomings in the implementation of the first wave. Large scale initiatives tend to roll out better that way uh, versus doing everything at one shot. So I, again, I would support strong language in this motion that, that tells us that the expectation is district wide, but that we had some area of flexibility with rolling out. Ms. Shaw. Yeah, so September 28th is gonna come here before we know it. And if there's still, oh, that's when the law goes into effect in terms of not allowing mass requirements. That's only seven weeks from now. And if it takes two weeks for us to even implement whatever the pilot schools are, you know, we'll be rolling up out to all the schools um, over the course of a very short time, only the five weeks or four weeks we have left uh, before uh, our, our mask requirement um, might not be possible. And so, you know, I'm happy to have an amendment, uh, amend my original motion um, and have the motion um, be instead that uh, we will do, uh, we will support um, the pool testing uh, with a pilot uh, of schools uh, with the expectation that the district ramps up this to uh, have this district wide before the September 28th. I'll take seven weeks versus just only getting three or four. So for me, I'm fine. I can support uh, Dr. Gravois Shaw's recommendation. So I'll, I'll um, accept the friendly amendment as the seconder. And then Dr. Trujillo, if some concern happens, then please, you know, at our next meeting, let us know what the concerns are so we can um, amend this if necessary. I do think that we should have some language in there um, allowing for flexibility, staffing issues, anything like that. And the expectation I think is important for us to get it out to as many schools as possible. But seven weeks with us on the fourth day and we're still dealing with transportation things, I just don't wanna overwhelm the system. Just to clarify, so if we were to go forward with uh, Dr. Ravoy Shaw's amended uh, motion, um, then the expectation is at after seven weeks, every school would be going through with this program or they will already be um, through with the training? Or is it like the potential 20 or whatever um, schools who opt in will by the, that date or like, sorry, I'm just a little confused about. Michelle, the intention of the amended resolution um, was that all the schools are offering pool testing in seven weeks. Okay. Before the 28th of September. Okay, I can unite with that. So do we have, we have a second for that motion already? Yeah, Ms. Yes. Grijalva. I did second it. Yeah, Ms. Grijalva did. Okay, thank you. Um, can we do a roll call vote? Yes. Ms. Grijalva? Yes. Dr. Gravosha? Yes. Ms. Luna Rose? Yes. Ms. Shaw? Yes. Ms. Counts? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. 
Thank you, Mr. Leighton. Thank you. Really excited to partner with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, <clears throat> moving on to item 7.2, Dr. Trujillo. Yes, the, the co-feature item of the evening tonight is um, an initial expenditure proposal for ESSER 3's immediate needs. Um, that is, of course, those of you watching in the public, the elementary school, secondary school economic recovery fund. Uh, that was the district's uh, $176 million award. We have an initial wave, an initial proposal of some of the immediate needs that we need funding for and in from that particular uh, allocation. Also tonight for your consideration are capital project requests coming from both ESSER 3 and ESSER 2 from the school level. Uh, and here to uh, mostly focused on outdoor learning space configurations, here to walk us through tonight's uh, item and request for governing board approval is our director for federal grants and programs. We've seen him a few times before, Mr. John Lanza. Welcome back, sir. Great, thank you, Dr. Trujillo. Good evening, everybody. Uh, President Counts, Board Clerk Shaw, Governing Board members, thank you for having me tonight to share this with you. I'm gonna go ahead and um, start with a little bit of an overview of the ESSER 2, and then we'll move into ESSER 3. So to begin, uh, on your screen there, you see a summary actually of all three ESSER grants. These are federal grants. Again, these three grants came from the stimulus packages that were passed by the federal government. ESSER 1 was $18.5 million, and we are, are pretty much wrapping that grant, grant up. It started over a year ago, really helped us sustain through the COVID pandemic uh, and the virtual learning that occurred last year. ESSER 2 we received in the spring our allocation amounts, and that has been the, the focus of our work the last three months. I believe uh, June 8th is when I um, shared with you kind of our plans and, and how we are working with the schools and developing their budgets and getting the input from site councils and uh, the principals putting together all the work to, to really uh, meet the needs at their school site. So that has been our focus as ESSER 2, uh, 76.3 million. And then looking forward, uh, you'll get a glimpse of this tonight. Uh, we're at the very beginning, uh, really the planning stages of ESSER 3. Uh, that is the, the very large um, uh, amount you see there, 172.9 million, and that uh, sustains through uh, September 2024. So there's still three years left uh, with ESSER 3. Uh, there were additional requirements with ESSER 3, uh, public input sessions. We'll review you know, a little bit of that here in a second. Uh, we're right now starting to look at um, like what a full budget would be for this. But I think most importantly, the last item you see listed there on, on the bullet, we have some immediate budget needs that we want to propose to you tonight to use ESSER 3 and start um, really designating the money for immediate needs that we have to start the school year with ESSER 3. Uh, next slide. Just uh, another reminder of the purpose and really the intent of uh, all three of these ESSER grants. Uh, the wording that you'll continue to hear over and over throughout all of them is prevention, preparation, and response to the coronavirus pandemic. This is the intent of them. Uh, really everything that we, we allocate with this money, we, we always wanna be able to point back and, and really you know, how is it in prevention, preparation, response to COVID-19 and, and the circumstances that have come out of that. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. That is really uh, the intent of these, these monies. And then what you see listed there, the seven uh, different categories, we've used these to really guide our decision-making across the district and, and really with the principals, uh, they've put together some amazing plans for each one of their schools, very detailed and, and I guess articulated to the needs of their school, but they all focus around these seven areas, academic loss, educational technology, mental health support or social emotional learning, uh, recruitment and retention, personal protective equipment, distance learning and minimizing or mitigating transmission. So those have been kind of our guiding um, categories that we've used as we've made decisions. Next slide. Okay, so now um, this is gonna be just a kind of a review of ESSER 2. So just an update uh, this is really kind of our life right now is with ESSER 2 managing this and, and really uh, determining where the money's going. But each school 
uh, was allocated $350,000. And so this was in June we began this process. Uh, we focus, if you remember, on five core areas, and you see those listed there. Interventionists, curriculum service providers, MTS, MTSS facilitators, counselors, and social workers. And really the, the focus uh, for the schools and the, the principals in, in guiding this was really using those five positions and leveraging them in the schools and the impact that they have on, on students and the academic needs and support as they're coming back. Uh, curriculum service providers, that was a support for teachers and the professional development and the, uh, the support, the mentoring, the coaching they provide uh, teachers. MTSS, obviously that is for really student focus, um, supports the tiers of intervention and really making sure that is in place in all our schools, counselors, additional counseling support, and then additional social work support in our school. So really trying to take a, a well-rounded approach in, in the different needs of a school, addressing it from those five areas and ensuring that every student across our district has those, those resources available to them in the schools. Schools had different, I guess, starting points for this with, as far as having those resources in place. Some had them, some didn't. As schools put together their plans, if they were able to, if they had one of those positions or the supports in place in their school, that created a, a funding vacancy. They, made, they didn't need to spend part of that 350,000 on one of those areas. And from that point, they, they would go to a school menu. And so this is in on our June 8th meeting. Um, this is something that you approved was this menu of items that they could go to that were eligible, but that they could really go and, and kind of package together a plan from their school from those eligible items that met the needs that were identified by their site council, by their PTA, PTOs, and, and their staff. So that combination, 350,000, focused on the five areas and then going to the school menu is what schools have been working on over the summer as they've developed their budgets. Okay, next slide. Further update on ESSER 2. So as uh, principals have started uh, identifying their, their budgets, uh, on the left are kind of some main themes that have come out of this. There, were, there was really a, a need for additional social distancing options. Things like desks, tables, chairs. You, you heard a little bit about it tonight. Um, things as, as simple as, as cafeteria seating, uh, having the ability to buy additional tables, uh, spreading kids out. Uh, you, you said it earlier um, several times that you know, the outdoor seating options need to explore those. So that is something that, that ESSER has allowed principals to have more flexibility with. So social distancing options, educational technology, obviously one-to-one -one, uh, uh, initiatives, making sure all our students have the educational technology if, they, if we do go virtual, but also that is actually really kind of, I guess, bolstered a lot of the technology in the classroom with the kids coming back to school with these skills. And we're still trying to make sure that they have the technology available to them through a one-to-one -one initiative. Uh, outside learning space options, those are in some planning stages. You'll see those a little bit uh, further along here. And then the ongoing mitigation strategies, um, really getting a little more refined in that. And, and the principals have started to identify things like additional water bottle filling stations. You'll see and hear a little bit about uh, outdoor hand washing stations. So, as we've kind of learned about the, the needs and extra steps we can take for mitigation, you'll see that in some additional approaches to make sure uh, our students are in safe spots and safe environments. Mr. Lansley, okay, next yes. if I can ask, um, you know, so our, one of our, you know, I'm really excited about these projects and really excited about getting these in our schools. And one of the concerns we expressed uh, when we approved uh, these funds is to make sure we're actually able to use the funds uh, before they expire. And what is the like, status on actually purchasing a lot of the capital items and having positions posted uh, and ready to hire? Are we, are we there yet or are we still kind of in the planning phase for all this? Great question. So Dr. Raboy Shah, the, um, I guess there's two parts of that, right? There's kind of the staffing piece. And so we have been able to start hiring with this. Uh, we're over 50 additional staff that we've been able to hire for these positions. Uh, and then we are right in the middle with capital and ordering. Um, that, that is something that right now we're setting a budget code. Schools have started uh, the ordering process. One of our big challenges right now is just the, the, the time frame on the quick turnaround. Uh, we do know that we're hitting some, some delays and just you know getting orders in for things like technology and, and some of the capital. But 
uh, we're actively in the middle of that process. And so staff have been hired uh, and we do, we are starting the order process through the schools. Um, ESSER two, our time frame for that, as far as using the funds, that goes through September 2023. So we, we have still a full two years, but really um, what we've, we've looked at in, in a lot of the schools of budget is trying to get this in place for this year. So we are right at the beginning of uh, doing a lot of the ordering and, and you know, we're starting to see some of these things start to come in over the next couple of months. Did that answer your question? All right, so you said 50 of the, of the staff members have been hired um, and that we approved for semester two out of how many? Uh, we're, we're over 50 at this point. I can actually uh, get you a, a specific number if you want. Um, but yeah, we, we've started ordering. We have a full list uh, in each one of those five areas of, of folks we've been able to find. And recently, we've just um, kind of released it now to the schools. We were doing an approach where we were uh, gathering the candidates and putting them in high need schools and, and areas in our district that we knew that had immediate needs. Uh, the pools have now kind of dried up in a sense. Most of the hiring has been done over the summer. Um, but I can get you a specific number if, if you would like. I and mean, just to keep us informed, because like, again, with the capitals, you know, expenses, whether they have purchased now or purchased in 2022, you know, this is going to be spent. But um, we approved two years of funding for these positions. So every month that we don't have the position filled, unless we're hiring more people or spending that money on capital, we're going to be losing that money. So. Correct. Right. So updated. actually, that is a, a great point. I'll point out here on this next slide, um, kind of the, I think you're referring to the next steps. If we don't hire those positions, what do we do with the money? So uh, actually, thank you. This is this next slide has come up. So capital projects with ESSER2, this is where some of that, that uh, unspent costs now can start moving into. So currently, we have 53 projects that principals have identified at 35 sites. So this is, these 35 sites are, are sites that had additional budget capacity out of that 350,000, and we're able to start some projects right now. Uh, the example you just uh, kind of pointed to is, as we are able to um, identify money that's not spent, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a position is not hired and we're, we don't have anybody available, principals starting on October 1st are going to be able to go back into their ESSER 2 budget and do revisions. And we want them to do this on a consistent basis. So October 1st is when that's gonna open up. Any unfilled positions, principals will be able to reallocate that money. And one of the things that we really are, want to start seeing happen is as that money gets freed up again, having them put it into capital projects. So outdoor learning spaces, shade structures, playground equipment. Uh, we have several schools with gardens, basketball court refinishing. Uh, carpet removal. There's some things that just need need to be in a little uh, little better condition in the school. So uh, right now, 35 sites have started this process. Uh, October 1st, we are going to be able to open up those budgets again and let them start redesigning. And this is an area that we're going to start uh, really start to see develop more. Our, our goal is to help guide all these schools uh, through the course of ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 we want to be able to guide them through every single site having some sort of capital project or some sort of capital need being met. So uh, ESSER 2 has got us so far. Uh, there'll be some revisions on that. And then ESSER 3 is that next step that Dr. Trujillo was mentioning, where that's where we want to do some real forward planning on what schools can do with the capital projects. Uh, just additional information on this slide. Projects, uh, as they are, are developed at the school site, uh, then are passed on to the operations department to oversee those. Uh, that is one area that we are going to need some additional support in because this many projects across this many sites uh, this has become a little bit of a management challenge. And so you'll see in a bit here, uh, there's part of the ESSER 3 proposals, additional support to actually have these projects happen. Uh, and then on the, the board docs, a full list is available of the current projects again it's 53 projects at 35 sites that is is being funded at this point um can i ask a question before you come off of this slide michelle sure. yes okay so um so you're saying that all of these projects have to be approved they're going like the school is coming up with quotes or whatever and sending them where do they go is that an internal like um are they going to engineers for structural? Are they going, I mean, what's the approval process? 
Sure. So the first step is just making sure they have the budget at their site. So within that 350,000 and that it's 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 a, a project that is, um, again, related to COVID or has some sort of connection and, and is eligible. At that point, when they have the budget capacity that is given to the operations department. And so within the operations department, they have managers that oversee these projects. So that's where uh, the quotes come in. That's where some of the internal, um, basically the, the making sure the budget can hold all, all of what's included. Sometimes that's blue staking, sometimes that's plans. Um, so that's where operations takes over. And that's the same process really with any capital project in our district. It's just that this is ESSER specific funding that's really ramped up the volume of them. Uh, but it's in the operations department, they handle that. Okay, my understanding is there's a, a bottleneck happening with that approval process with engineers. And so we have schools that have the capacity according to the budgets and the quotes that they, um, that they brought forward and that now those are, I mean, if depending, the cost of everything continues to increase. And so if something's been sitting in a queue for like two months, that proposal and that budget might not actually, you, you have to revise it because things are changing. And so, um, and then what's the communication back to the schools if this bottleneck is happening and they're waiting for the expenditure? And, and I do know just from county from friends who are trying to build things. I mean, there aren't enough contractors at this point to go around to get things done. And so that's why I was asking about how we're gonna address some of these issues to ensure that the funds are expended, that we get the, you know, these structures out to our schools. Um, and then I know that we said 350 per school. Was there any accommodation for schools that are larger, smaller, some schools that, you know, don't have the capacity or space to spend on some of these? I just was wondering about the difference in size of some of our campuses. Sure, so maybe the, the first uh, kind of issue you brought up, you're, you're absolutely right. There is a bottleneck when you get 35 projects in, I mean, really within two months, you know? And so that you'll see one of the requests for ESSER 3 is that we are able to hire a project manager uh, on the operations side to just take these projects on and make sure they, they get done. So that is a very real challenge right now is, is operations capacity to take them all on. They need some additional management there to be able to do that. This, the second thing you brought up, you know, with as far as the 350,000, that was, if you remember, based on those five areas and ensuring that all of our kids had those resources and those supports available. So it wasn't, um, this wasn't like a Title I uh, per people allocation where each student has an amount. This was given to every single school, regardless if they were Title I or not. Uh, we wanted to make sure that they all had the chance to get additional intervention. Get yeah, no, I, I, do, I do think that if we look at this at all um, and have to readjust budgets, that kind of thing, um, I, the needs are greater at some of our campuses than others. And while I want all of them to have some of this access, we also have some PTOs and some businesses that have helped to contribute and um, I don't want to penalize those schools for being able to get those uh, those services, but I do think that it's important for us to look at at um, some of our like an equity issue as well. Okay. And some of our campuses are just bigger. I mean, there's some of our schools that are in really good shape and are smaller. And um, if so, if there is an opportunity, like in most sort of distribution of grant funds, where we have to adjust, I think it would be helpful for us to look at those schools that have an excess of projects and have already expended their funds. Maybe okay. encouraging schools to have, you know, sort of a backup project in, in case, you know, we ever have to do that kind of readjustment. But thank you, I appreciate the presentation. Great, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely look at that. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and move to the next slide here. So that was kind of ESSER 2, with where we were at over the last, one more thing in answer too. I really appreciate the um, list of the capital projects. If like when that in the future, can we get that with um, the sites listed there as well? So we, instead of listing outdoor learning spaces 12 times uh, next to each other, we can you know get a sense of where this is happening. Yes. Yeah, so you um, actually there was an update with the sites um, that went into the board doc. So uh, we did put those in with the sites. I think you're looking at maybe one from from last week that we okay. first gave out. All right, so, yeah, I um, downloaded it this weekend when I was reading it. Okay, 
Thank you. Okay, so yeah, if you go on board docs right now, they're they're actually listed by site. Great. And um, those are the schools again that had capacity within the three hundred fifty thousand, and that uh, you know the sites, the site administration, and site council they identified those as as needs they wanted to dive into right now. So. Great. Thank you. Good. Okay. All right, so that was ESSER 2 and, and kind of a summary of really the last two months from when we met on June 8th to, to now. Uh, now looking forward, so ESSER 3, this now is an update, maybe just uh, ESSER 3 is a little different. Um, there were additional requirements. So public input meetings was one of the first things that was different. Uh, we have had four meetings over the summer uh, with TUSD staff, TUSD bargaining units, the TUSD community, parents, and then we did the same uh, community in Spanish. Uh, so that has happened. That was a requirement to get the input. And, and a lot of the input was right in line with what you were seeing the schools. Uh, schools actually involved their site council and PTO. So we had a lot of that community and staff input already. Um, but, but a lot of the concerns and needs for additional seating, social distancing, uh, technology, learning spaces, those were very similar themes in the public input. Uh, grant, the details of the grants uh, were also a uh, little, little different. So right now we are, we've added that input in there, but we also have to have 20% of our funds for ESSER 3 focused on academic loss. So summer school was, was a big example for that. And we have to actually track it by subgroup. So this will probably be something as we actually start allocating these funds over the next three years, I'll probably be coming back and sharing you, sharing with you what is falling into those buckets and how we're addressing 20% and the subgroups across the school. And then finally, uh, again, the, the date, we have three years on this, so we're right at the very, very beginning of just the planning for ESSER 3. The immediate needs right now um, is really kind of the, I guess the end point of this presentation. Uh, we wanted to bring it to study and action so you can look at the items. And then we also uh, wanted to point out that these items were, there are things that we had started with ESSER 2 that we just weren't able to fit into the ESSER 2 budget. Uh, like the very top item there, the technology for students, the one-to-one -one initiative. We started that with ESSER 1 and ESSER 2. And to finish it out, we needed to push this into ESSER 3. These items are things that as we start the school year, we wanted to um, get in front of you and ask for your uh, vote on using ESSER 3 monies to start these parts now at the beginning of the school year. So just kind of a quick rundown of them. You see at the top technology. So there's a one-to-one -one initiative for the students we need to finish out. Uh, classroom technology, things like Promethean boards and the upgrading of classrooms. Uh, staff, so still making sure that our staff has access to technology, uh, both in the classroom, but also if we, we do have to go virtual and things like TUVA and some of these additional areas that have developed, making sure the staff is, is adequate, adequately supplied with what they need. Uh, you see four operations uh, items listed there. One, I think it was, was last month at the board meeting, you heard uh, the city of Tucson, a partnership to include shade coverings. Uh, our half of that is that 300,000. It's at six different sites, and it would provide shade covering over basketball, outdoor learning spaces is what that would fall under. Hand washing stations, uh, 500,000 for that. Start keeping the water bottle filling stations going to the schools. And then the uh, project manager that we mentioned that uh, Ms. Grijalva brought up with the, the management of these projects, this is where we, we know there's a need. So we're asking for uh, the next three years to be able to hire a project manager through operations just to be able to manage the ESSER projects that are going to just continue to build from here. We're 35 now, 35 sites, but we want to have them at every single one of our schools. And so having somebody designated to be able to handle that load. Uh, curriculum and instruction to begin this school year, there are a lot of online resources and subscriptions that teachers are still uh, using within the classroom and that things like UVA and, and some of our virtual learning that's, that's developed, they still need access. To. So we do need to continue those subscriptions to start this school year. Uh, ESSER sick leave through human resources. We wanna be able to offer that opportunity to, if, if people were to um, come in contact, be sick with ESSER, be able to offer still sick leave through the end of this, this uh, calendar year. Uh, added duty for before and after school. 
Uh, this is uh, something we want to be able to offer at the elementary and middle school. This is tied to a certain degree to the transportation of being able to have staff available before and after school uh, due to the hub model of kids maybe coming early or having to wait for those buses, uh, being able to have that, that coverage uh, there at the schools. And then the very last item is just to kind of, so you know this is on our radar for ESSER 3. We're not identifying any money for it right now, but additional capital projects and outdoor learning spaces at all of our schools. So having that as a focus for ESSER 3, that will take some time developing, but knowing that that's a focus for ESSER 3 going forward. Again, not a budget item right now, but knowing that that is something we want to start planning for ESSER 3. So in closing, these are, this is the, um, what we're asking, those, that list of items, it is $23,336,800 worth of items. Those are immediate needs that we want to be able to start budgeting ESSER 3, uh, the ESSER 3 grant for, so that we can start using those to begin the school year. And with that, um, again, the study action is uh, basically asking for approval for those items and that we can start the procurement process for those items that we have a uh, dollar amount for. And I any questions, I'll just open it up at this time. Any discussion board members? Yeah, uh, Ms. Shaw. Thank you, um, Mr. Lanza. So um, as I'm looking at the last one, I know it's two to be determined, but the capital projects, are we, when, um, is that separate from the outdoor learning spaces, number one? And then if they, if it is, does it mean for things like newer HVAC systems? Because I know that there were some issues with some schools this week and last week um, uh, that had issues with hot classrooms. And I'm concerned if we're having um, everyone wear masks that, you know, that they're, the kids are comfortable in doing so. Sure, so yes, that, uh, that, that actually includes kind of all those areas you touched on. We, we've talked up to this point primarily about outdoor learning spaces. That has been kind of the most obvious need. You know, we're able to use these ESSER funds for uh, outdoor learning spaces to spread the kids out. Um, that has been the most, the clearest example of it. As we get into other capital projects, we're gonna to have to analyze them to really see is it related to COVID? Is it gonna help in, in the response or the mitigation of COVID? Um, so that's a little more general category. We're just capital projects. We're gonna to have to go through them, but we do wanna have improvement at all the schools. We wanna be able to use this money so that it's got a lasting impact. We're able to say that was you know, an area that, was, that we were able to use ESSER funds on and improve. So outdoor learning space is the term we've been using to begin, but larger capital projects, I think, is where, you know, a lot of this, we want to see it develop into. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Shaw? Yes. So is the request tonight to approve all the items that have a dollar value, or are we also being requested to approve that one that's still to be determined? The one that it's, you were talking it's just the dollar value. The okay. TBD is just knowing that that's kind of our next steps we want to start addressing with SR3. Yeah, if I could, if I could chime in here, um, thank you for the opportunity to clarify, Dr. Gavoy Shah. We were concerned about the community narrative uh, that only 35 schools got 50 something projects. So we wanted to be extremely clear that we're not finished, that those 35 projects are coming from ESSER 2. We have projects planned at the remainder of the schools that will are forthcoming from ESSER 3. Um, so it's more for the community narrative to let them know that it's on the way we're going to continue to be working with <clears throat> continue working with our site administrative teams to make sure that all of our schools have an opportunity to consider a capital project out of ESSER 3. And if a true if a school uh, wants to use its ESSER 3 dollars in other areas, we're going to work with them there as well. But we wanted to be very, very clear that the board's approval tonight of ESSER 2 funded capital projects is not the end. We still have a lot more coming uh, out of ESSER 3. So it, it's just more for uh, clarity and for the narrative. <clears throat> um, and just to be clear, some of these things that I'm looking at now, like the uh, curriculum subscription, is that, uh, we already had a presentation on, on that, correct? 
Yes, I, and John, you can you can chime in here, but a big bulk of, of the curriculum, those are our instructional delivery systems that are delivered virtually, and largely it's our it's our learning management system uh, that we that, that we've just approved. So everything that makes the virtual learning possible uh, is rolled up in that six million dollar figure. And yes, we've had presentations on all of those items. Thank you for clarifying. Um, and also, I mean. I'm looking at the project manager yearly salary. Is that just standard for our district to chart, um, pay people that high a rate? Or is that like so a that's, amount? It's an approximation there, but that, um, that includes benefits. So benefits is usually 30% is what we have to factor in. So uh, you could look at that number. It's a three-year cost. You know, break it into thirds, 100000 a year, and 30% uh, of that being benefits. So that's kind of covering everything involved with that. I see. Thank you. Ms. Shaw, I'd like to go ahead and move the item. I'll second. Okay. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Hi. Okay, item passes. All right, moving on. Uh, oh, thank you, Mr. Lanza. Great, thank you guys. Okay, um, item 8.1, Dr. Trujillo. Yes, item 8.1, and I again, I wanna thank Mr. Lanza and his team and federal grants and programs for just some outstanding work. I mean, there is a lot of expenditure requests coming in in a lot of different areas with ESSER. And I know that they're moving as diligently and as quickly as possible. So I wanna thank them for their efforts and their, res their quick, responsive, um, <clears throat> quick responsiveness to our schools. Item 8.1, uh, I'd like to welcome our director for um, community schools and pre-k programming in the district mrs reen kivet it's a relatively quick item she has a recommendation uh, we are not seeing the normal business that we would see in the early morning hours at Brickta and uh, shoemaker i believe it's both and we're looking to do some service adjustments uh, so that we can offer better quality service during the higher traffic parts of the day so with that i'll turn it over to mrs kivet Good evening, board, um, president, counts, distinguished board members, Dr. Trujillo and legal counsel. As uh, Dr. Trujillo mentioned, we will give a quick overview of the happenings at the Infant and Early Learning Center. And with me tonight, my co-presenter and amazing colleague, um, Heather Nordbrock, the program coordinator at Shoemaker Infant and Early Learning Center will um, be assisting me. Next slide, please. So our infant and early learning centers have a focus on early childhood education. We serve children six weeks to pre-kinder in a loving educational environment. The centers are open weekdays, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. throughout the year, including summers. We foster positive relationships among children and adults and take pride in uh, creating safe and healthy environments. We use a research-based approach to learning through creative curriculum. Um, our teachers create high quality learning environments that follow best practice and provide individualized instruction. Um, children are given ample opportunity to explore, discover, and develop their critical thinking skills. Next slide, please. This is an overview of our 21-22 um, school year calendar. We are closed for the following national holidays. I do want to make note that our centers are open during rodeo, they don't close. We also um, are open during some of our winter breaks. So we have four days off of the two weeks um, that everyone else gets off. Um, and then also we are closed four days throughout the year, one day per quarter to offer professional all day professional development opportunities to our teachers. 
Next slide, please. This is our fee schedule. So it's broken down by monthly rate, biweekly rate, and weekly rate. This uh, gives families an opportunity to select what is easiest for them when paying tuition. We have our infant rates, our toddler rates, and preschool rates, and then it's broken down by public rate and TUSD discounted employee rate. We also charge a $50 supply fee twice a year. Next slide, please. So um, these are Shoemaker and Brickta's current enrollment numbers. Uh, I also listed for you the numbers we had pre-COVID. So you can see we are very uh, low enrolled in comparison to where we once were. Uh, we also listed our teachers and staff at, at each site and each site does have a wait list right now. And I will tell you, I'm officing at Brickta that the phones don't stop ringing at Brickta and Shoemaker for uh, with families who are interested um, and desperate for care. Unfortunately, we don't have any um, viable applicants, if any applicants at all. Um, we will get maybe five or 10 applicants. We try to set up interviews. They decline or are no-shows or um, don't meet minimum requirements. So. We are super struggling like everyone else to recruit um, qualified candidates so that we could take care of our wait list and rebuild. I will say though that these numbers are much higher than they were during COVID um, in the last year. So we are seeing gains and we know that the interest and need is there. We just need staffing in order to be able to respond um, to our community. Okay, next slide. In now order to, to hand, oh, yep, I'm gonna hand it over <laughs> to Heather. Thanks, Heather. Yep, in order to help meet that need for our wait list, we are looking at changing our hours from the 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. As a tuition-based program, we need to be able to staff our program when we have our students. And as licensed facilities, we have a ratio at all times that we must meet, meaning our staff to student ratio needs to meet a student, student to staff minimum. And so currently, we have staff that is on campus at 6 a.m. when we do not have students. And then in the afternoon, when we have the high number of students between three and four, our staff has left for the day. So we wanted to look at how to best meet the needs of our program and have staff there when we have our kids there. Next slide, please. So based on that, we decided to survey our families and our staff to make sure that we had the community involvement in our decision-making process. We had um, a survey sent out to both the families and the staff that asked um, what center they were at, would the change in hours impact their continued enrollment or their employment? And if they would be impact, would that make them um, change their um, commitment to our programs? And then we asked them for some feedback. Next slide, please. We had 99 families that responded to the survey. Six families shared that the one hour change may cause them to unenroll their child from the program. That was a 0.06 percentage of the families that were surveyed. And then 13 families said it could create a burden that they would make it work. Um, there's an error in that slide that should be a 0.13%, not 13%. Um, of the 30 teachers and staff that responded to the survey, zero of them would have to discontinue employment or be impacted by the change they would all keep their same FTE and number of hours. So our ProCare data shows each day, our ProCare system is sort of what we use, it's similar to Synergy. It's just based for um, infant and early learning center programs with a little bit more um, usage for what we need. That showed that at Shoemaker, we never have more than two to four children on campus that arrive before 7 a.m. And at Brickta, they don't ever have one, more than one to four students um, that arrive before that 7 a.m. time. Often we both have zero kids on campus before 7 a.m. Next slide. 
Thank you for allowing us to present to you this evening about our change in hours. This is an opportunity now for you to ask questions, feedback, or concerns you might have. Thank you both for your presentations. Board members, any comments or questions? So th this is an informational item. We know that we've got five parents on this board. We know that parents are very passionate about um, early childhood education as well as supervision of their kids. We at least wanted the board in the know and we wanted the community to know the why. Um, and I wanna thank community schools and Reem and Heather for doing that work and making our parents a part of the decision-making process with the surveys and, and the focus groups, I think that's great. Uh, so I can support this adjustment. Obviously we need to match the need. We have higher, um, higher class sizes and a larger group of students to service during the latter part of the day. So this makes sense uh, for, for us. Well, Ms. Shaw? Yes. So you mentioned in the presentation um, that this shouldn't help ad address some of the wait lists. Do you know how many more students we'll be able to serve because of this change? So um, I'm thinking for Brickta right now, this could help us essentially serve maybe 10 or 15 more students. It's not much. Um, it really will come down to also staffing, you know, hiring. Um, if we were to hire, if I was to hire about three or four more staff max, maybe even three, I could take care of most of that wait list at Brickta. I'm not sure for Shoemaker what that looks like, Heather. For Shoemaker with the change of hours, I also should be able to add about 10 um, families from our wait list. Again, we are in the process of hiring right now as we hire um, some of those staff that go through the process right now with HR, we'll be able to bring also um, some families in off the wait list above and beyond what that 10 was that we can add by the change of hours. And I don't think we mentioned it, but this would go into effect on September oh, yeah. 7th, the day after Labor Day. Um, and we've been communicating with staff and families about it, so it's, it will be no surprise. And uh, tomorrow morning, we will let them know that we've presented to you and it's a go um, and to start planning for it um, if need be. Thank you for uh, the presentation. Thank you, have a great evening. Thank you. On, um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, governing board members. Uh, our next item is uh, we just want to give a quick update on the status of exceptional education programming here to kick off the school year. Like transportation, we've experienced some staffing issues that uh, we've been able to uh, work collaboratively with uh, TEA and Eli. They provided some invaluable feedback to help us navigate uh, some of these challenges. That involves staffing and maybe reassigning <clears throat> the location of some of our services as well as employees. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our director for exceptional ed, Dr. Sabrina Salmon. Thank you, Dr. Trujillo. Good evening, President Council, Clerk Shaw, members of the board, legal counsel Ross. I'm here this evening just to share updates on what we've experienced in the exceptional education department as we move into the 2021-22 school year. Next slide, please. So we've heard the questions and the concerns around staffing from many members this evening and also on other accounts. And so um, this is just some information from polling that was done by a national organization about how COVID has impacted um, staffing for teachers across the nation. And so we've all seen an impact. And then for exceptional education, um, the impact has been double what it has been for general education. So we've definitely seen it in our teacher population 
population and our teaching assistant population in our school psychologists, our social workers, our speech paths, our occupational therapists, our physical therapists. So in all areas that we provide instruction and related services, we definitely had a decrease in the number of applicants for all of our vacancies, as well as an increase in people who were leaving the field or people who were eligible for retirement and decided to retire after last school year. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to show you is how it's impacted our staff and our programs in TUSD specifically. So we'll have a breakdown by region of the impact and where our vacancies are. Um, we also have an indication of what we've done to mitigate some of these staffing shortages. Um, as Dr. Trujillo mentioned, we've worked collaboratively with Eli TEA and also building principals and some of our lead teachers to come up with some ideas to minimize the impact that we have on our students. So we'll have a regional breakdown and then we'll have a summary of some of those impacts and some potential solutions. So as you see in region one, the overall big picture is we're understaffed by three resource teachers, um, two self-contained teachers and seven paraprofessionals. And then it shows by school where those needs are. And we were able to use some contracted teachers from vendors to place the teacher at Pister and then also a paraprofessional at Wakefield. Next slide, please. Okay, here's region two. We're down two resource teachers, four self-contained teachers and 15 paraprofessionals. And we can see here how that impacts Tucson High, Pueblo, Drachman, Holiday, Leonard Keatis and Ochoa. Next slide, please. Region three, um, we have seven resource teacher vacancies, three self-contained teacher vacancies, and seven paraprofessionals. And we see the impact at Catalina, Doolin, Mansfield, Cragen, Utterback, Wright, Cabot, and Davidson. And our paraprofessionals are an essential part of our ex ed programs. Most of our programs are designed so that we have one teacher in the self contained program and two paraprofessionals. And so that's essential for safety and for the continuity of care and support for our students. So once we're down two paraprofessionals, that's pretty much all that we would have in one classroom. Next slide, please. Region four, um, there are four resource teacher vacancies and 10 paraprofessional vacancies, um, with that impact being mostly at Booth Fickett, Kellon, and Sewell. Next slide, please. Okay, Region 5, there's a shortage of two resource teachers, two self-contained teachers, and 17 paraprofessionals across Region 5. And so the impact is at Saguaro, at Bloom, at Santa Rita, Still, and also at Marshall. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a summary of what the impact has been and what we've done to mitigate some of that impact for our regions. So early on in region one, we moved one teacher and two paraprofessionals from Monzo and Tolson. So that's already been done. That was done at the end of last school year and through the summer. And so that classroom was set up with staff members who were ready to support our students. So that's all established there. In region two, we moved one student from Ochoa to Whitmore and then two students remain at Ochoa and we're received, they're gonna receive support um, through a resource model instead of through a self-contained program because the program essentially had three students who were enrolled. And so we didn't have to make any staff adjustments for this change. In Region 3, we moved five students from Utterback to Roberts Naylor, and this was done at the end of last school year. And so we also moved eight students from Cragen. Um, three went to Dietz, two went to Lineweaver, three to Tolley, no staff changes for these adjustments. And the reason that we needed to move so many students from Cragen was um, there was a sudden resignation from the teacher. And so we had no leads on teachers at that point. And our programs at Dietz, Lineweaver, and Tully had space available. And so we were able to discover that 
um, before the start of the school year and go ahead and make those reassignments. And um, when we are making reassignments from our self-contained programs, we have our assistant directors call and talk to the parents directly and let them know um, that there's gonna be a change and explain the reason and help them get in queue for transportation and answer any questions that they have about the program. Um, Pre-COVID, we would be able to offer um, visits to the school and so that they would be able to see the program prior to going there. Um, during COVID, we've done just some virtual visits or we've done like some Zoom meetings where the parents were able to meet the teachers, the principal and other staff members that might be supporting the students at the receiving school. In Region 4, we moved seven students from Booth Thicket to Vail. This move occurred in the 2021 school year because we were not able to fill that teacher vacancy at Booth Thicket. And so this happened during COVID um, as a hub location. And so the students were able to continue um, and provide their programming and services at Vail. So there were no staff changes for this adjustment. And then in Region 5, we moved one teacher and one student from Dunham to Marshall. And so we moved four students from Santa Rita, and one student went to Choya, one to Palo Verde, and two students to Rencon. And with these moves, we were able to notify um, the parents prior to the start of the school year. So they were informed about what school their children would be attending. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's just a summary of some possible solutions to self-contained programming shortages. Um, this is what we've experienced and what we were able to do thus far. Um, we are anticipating if we don't end up being able to recruit and hire more teachers, we could possibly need to make some adjustments or some changes in the future. And so our first choice would be to adjust case flows and class rosters on each site when possible, especially when we have more than one exceptional education teacher. Maybe some teachers can take on a different load or maybe there can be some creative adjustments with scheduling. I know that Choya was able to adjust their schedules by changing the amount of elective courses that are offered. And so we were able to have fewer teachers take on the class list of students by doing that. We can also offer additional compensation to other staff on a campus. So if we are going to be asking teachers to do something above and beyond their typical workload and responsibility, um, we have a mechanism to provide additional compensation, whether they are teaching an additional class or if they are providing case management services. So helping with the IEP process and writing of the IEPs and then helping to allocate resources and provide services for our students based on what's on their IEPs. Um, our last option would be to reassign staff or students to another program. That's a last option if we don't have another avenue for getting staff to the location or reallocating the resources that are currently on that campus. Next slide, please. Okay. And so our high school resource positions are ones that are a little more difficult to provide staffing solutions for. And that's because at the high school level, we have students in six or seven periods, just depending on the school schedule. And because it's for credits, and so just the logistics of the master schedule and getting students with the amount of time that they need with the exceptional education teacher throughout the course of the school day can be a little trickier um, to navigate. And so some ideas that we have for solutions when those shortages are at high schools are providing over cap payment for existing teachers to serve as case managers and our right IEPs. That's something that the exceptional education department already has established. And so it's a practice we've had in the past by paying the additional money for teachers who take on these additional responsibilities. Um, we have job developer positions that are funded through the exceptional education department. Job developers typically teach courses that are focused on career investigations and career readiness. Um, if we don't have another option, we maybe could have job developers teach more resource courses, and that would typically be more help in English language arts and math and then consolidate more of the investigations or job development courses to assist in that area. Another idea is we have department chairs that are funded through exceptional education. Each high school has one department chair. Um, department chairs are the ex-ed contact person and they help 
with scheduling of IEP meetings. They are kind of the go-to person if they're general exceptional education needs. They typically teach a reduced day on their campus. And so maybe they might receive some additional compensation for teaching more courses at the high school level. And then we could also adjust some student schedules so that students with IEPs in certain areas are consolidated in similar courses. So then our teachers are supporting a larger group of students who are in the same course versus just a couple of students who are spread out in multiple courses throughout the school day. Next slide, please. And the next barrier that we've had is TUVA. So TUVA definitely has been a great opportunity for um, choice for our parents and our students. And we started off with TUVA. We were expecting to need two exceptional education um, teachers. And just to kind of give you a guideline for how we figured to, um, that we were figuring we'd have about 400 students in TUVA. And typically out of a student population, about 10% would usually have an IEP or would need exceptional education services. So we were anticipating about 40 students going to TUVA would have an IEP. As we see here, we have well over 200 students, almost 300 students um, from this information. And this is old information as of last week. As of today, we have 320 students. So again, if each exceptional education teacher would support 20 students, we definitely have a lot more teachers that we need to hire. So right now we are in the process of hiring 10 exceptional education teachers to support our students for the online learning opportunities at TUVA. We also have had some requests for students who have self-contained IEPs to attend school virtually. Next slide, please. So again, this is information that we had a week ago. It was about 40 students who have self-contained IEPs and the parents were requesting TUVA or virtual enrollment. This number has increased to 70 as of today. And so the way that TUVA works is it's a general education program. And then we have our exceptional education programs and our exceptional education programs are in person. And so we are just working as a team and collaboratively with other departments to try to figure out how we can best address this need um, to provide some opportunities for our students who have higher needs and typically um, would be assigned to a self-contained program. Next slide, please. All right, so here's some potential solutions and kind of a decision-making matrix that our exceptional education team has been going through. So we can use some criteria to determine enrollment of students at TUVA who have the self-contained IEP by one, considering is their medical condition. Like if a student has a medical condition and that's the reason that they're not gonna be able to attend school, and we have a program that's called Direct Link, and that would be homebound services. And so in order to participate in this program, um, a doctor would write a medical certification, sign off on a medical certification saying that a student would be unable to attend school for at least 60 days based on a medical condition. If the student meets that criteria, we could offer the homebound program um, to the parent and to the student. And we have teachers who would go into the homes and provide instruction, or that instruction could be provided virtually by the homebound teacher. Um, we also would consider like what kind of transportation needs a student would have and, and what the transportation impact is on getting them access to school because we wouldn't want, we've heard about the shortage of transportation and we don't want a lack of transportation to one of our in-person um, programs to prevent the student from getting FAPE and from having access to an education. Um, next, we would look at the grade level and if a student is on grade level or academically performing at or near grade level, then possibly the student could be a potential candidate for TUVA. Um, next, we would consider offering additional compensation to teachers in self-contained programs so they could provide the simultaneous instruction. So again, it would be optional. Um, there would be no pressure to the teacher to do this. And if the teacher decided to provide that simultaneous instruction, there would be additional compensation. Um, this could be in the form of using a swivel device. It is 
a robot that you would attach an iPad to in its motion and its voice activate it. So it would follow the teacher around while the student is at home on Zoom. Um, so giving the teacher access to what is happening in the classroom. We currently have 10 of these devices um, that we purchased last school year. We could also assign added duty to resource teachers with low caseloads. And so typically the resource teachers are supporting students with um, lower level needs. If a resource teacher on a campus um, wasn't supporting as many um, students, we may be able to help assign or create a schedule so that that teacher could provide some additional services based on the student's IEPs. And again, that would be additional compensation going to this teacher for providing this extra service. Um, the next option would be to review the campus caseloads. Um, we could hire some long-term subs um, when those are available. Um, if our long-term subs do not have an exceptional education um, certification, there are some limits to what they're able to do. However, it would be better to have someone um, versus no one. And then we also have an avenue for hiring contract teachers from vendors. Next slide, please. Okay, so that concludes my update. So I'll pause here for any questions or comments. Questions or comments, board members? I just have one quick question. Um, um, thank you for the um, presentation, Dr. Salmon. Um, but my quick, my quick question is, um, so the Tuva kids, um, are, there, are they, are we making sure that they're getting their specially designated instruction um, that, and that we're complying with IDEA? For any TUVA student that's enrolled and has a schedule at um, TUVA, yes, we would be making sure that we were in compliance with IDEA. If it's a student who did have an IEP for a self-contained program, this would require an IEP team meeting for the team to determine if TUVA would be a good fit and then what kind of specially designed programming and services that would need to be um, provided through TUVA. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Questions or comments? Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Salmon, for the uh, comprehensive presentation. You're welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, moving on to our last item, second to last item, 8.3, transportation update, Dr. Trujillo. Yes, uh, members of the governing board, I spent a, a significant amount of time going into detail in the superintendent's report. So I'm going to follow that up here with um, uh, more of an operational uh, report here on the uh, transportation situation here in the district. Uh, and I'll turn it over to our transportation director, uh, Ms. Martha Samora. Good evening, Dr. Trujillo, um, governing board members. Um, next page, please. Um, so our agenda uh, today includes uh, the transportation capacity, summer bus needs, um, school year 21-22 bus needs, hub uh, model overview, and steps to rebuild capacity. Next page, please. Um, we, heard Dr. we heard from Dr. Trujillo um, earlier today the highlights of how we got here. So let me start by going over um, an overview of our capacity. So in the uh, prior uh, prior to the pandemic, um, our bus routes required 275 drivers, and um, e during that time we were already struggling to maintain the number of drivers needed, and we relied heavily on contracted service. Um, we need 142. Oh, I'm sorry, 142 is the current. Uh, route capacity that we have with 152 drivers available and a limited service, uh, limited contracted service. Uh, for example, 
one of our contracted services that normally would take an average of about 450 students, currently is only able to take about 100. So the total numbers request, the total number of students that have requested transportation for this year is a little over 8,000 students. And in order to cover those 8,000 students, um, as we routed them, it required a total of 212 routes to provide those services. Uh, next, please. So during this last summer, we were asked to come up with a model that would provide transportation for the largest summer school program that we've seen in over the last 10 years. And we were asked to provide transportation to all of the elementary K-8 and middle schools and one school for exceptional education. So our department came up with the hub model option and that provided transportation to about a thousand students. Uh, next, please. So what we did is we essentially took, being that that hub model approach worked um, and was successful during the summer, we implemented something similar. We took a similar approach for this year and the model that we are using now that we've implemented prioritizes exceptional education students in McKinney-Vento, um, bringing that number to about 1,100 students. That requires 160 buses to cover that need. And during, during this model, it allows exit drivers uh, that have the time to help us support hub routes as available. So the other group of students that is eligible for transportation is the open enrolled students like Magnet, and self-contained gate and neighborhood students that live outside the walk zone. So that entire group is who becomes available or eligible, I'm sorry, for a hub model. In order for us to um, have a model approach, an optimal um, hub model approach, it requires about 54 buses. And at this point, we still need 28 buses um, to bring that to that optimal level. Next page, please. So in our efforts to gain 28 additional routes um, and add capacity to our hub model, we've continued to leverage um, any available capacity within the exit routes um, to add to the hubs. And we are working uh, very aggressively and um, attracting, hiring, and training new bus drivers uh, to increase that capacity. Next page, please. Um, uh, we are working with HR to fast track the hiring process for drivers um, using all available capacity on exit routes. Uh, we are making adjustments to hub locations as we see the ridership counts come back. And we are now working with a consultant to review and optimize marketing uh, to attract and retain drivers. We are also working with a consultant to assess and optimize transportation services. Next page, please. Um, and that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, I can try to help answer questions. Thank you, Ms. Zamora. Uh, board members, any questions or comments? Go ahead, Dr. Trio. As I said in the superintendent's report, um, this is a learning uh, opportunity for us. Uh, I will be coming forward with a consultant's final report and recommendations uh, that we will, of course, uh, bring to the governing board and the public. I will also be facilitating a subsequent series of forums to follow up the initial community forum that I facilitated last week. I'll be facilitating some more uh, parent forums in the coming weeks to talk about the status of the hub model and some of the challenges and how we can be able to address some of those challenges now that we're in the hub model. And of course, we're gonna be updating the governing board and the community frequently uh, through governing board meetings as we continue to uh, add drivers and bring neighborhood routes back, which is our number one commitment at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, one, I'm wondering if like for the hub stations, if we use, utilized um, a geographical information system, um, I know in the past the district used one, um, I believe it was named Arc View by 
ESRI. Um, I know now there's an updated version ARC GIS. And like, uh, are we utilizing that? Because like, from what I see on the map, like a lot of the schools hub stations are very far from their original school. For instance, Booth, one of Booth Fickett's hub stations is at Choyo, which is like 12 miles away. Glenman um, is at Gridley, which is 10 miles away. And that's like, you know, really unfortunate because that's a very great distance to travel, especially when some parents do not have transportation. Um, so I was wondering if somebody can speak to that. Also, um, Dr. Trujillo, I know we spoke about um, 30 or so new bus driver hires. Uh, however, I have not seen those hires reflected on the talent and acquisition report. Um, can you speak to that as well? Yeah, so we have 25 bus drivers that are in the state of finalizing hiring paperwork before they can actually appear for governing board approval, meaning drivers that have been recommended for hire have gone through the interview process, but they owe us some insurance information, they owe us additional applicant paperwork, uh, they are being uh, right now vetted in terms of background checks that once everything clears, we're looking at 25 drivers that will be eventually making their way to consent agendas. We had five, uh, or I'm sorry, four uh, that are ready for consent agenda item placement last week. Uh, we have another six that are going to be recommended this week. And of course, we have another 15 that are in the pipeline uh, with paperwork issues. It's also important to note that the last step isn't governing board approval. There's still a 40 hour training requirement. That is not anything that is a district requirement or even a state requirement. It's a federal requirement for a CDL. Most of these applicants, if not all of them, and correct me if I'm wrong, Martha, don't have a CDL and actually need to go into our class. We do offer uh, and facilitate these classes. It's 40 hours of instruction before they're road ready. So we have them hitting the classroom training at different times. So as they come out, you'll start to see their names on um, consent agenda items. That's correct. I mean, as far as your other question, we are using the routing software to determine where we place stops. Um, we are reviewing, though, as, the, as we see the ridership for those different hubs that we've created, and we are making adjustments. So we essentially have placed stops either based on the need or based on what we, our routes would allow us to do with what we had available. And as we see that change, we're making those adjustments. Thank you. Michelle. Yes. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, I think, a really big issue, um, and I really appreciate all the attention placed on this. You know, this really upset me last week because I heard stories from from a lot of parents and families about you know, how this is affecting them and disrupting kind of the start of the school year. My own experience was, you know, in the same vein. Um, just two days before school started, there was no, there's, there was just no information about whether there'll be a bus to take uh, my own daughter to Keiko and at 2.30 on Thursday afternoon on the first day of school, I was called by my daughter's school that there wasn't, in fact, a bus and uh, nowhere for her to go except for just hanging out at Cub Care for a few, uh, if we needed it. But I, I, let, I left work at 2.30 in the afternoon to pick my daughter up from, from her school because there wasn't a bus to our after school program and that just really sucked. And uh, I think a lot of families had a lot of disruptions to their own work schedules and their own lives trying to get their kids to and from the hubs or to and from school with last minute changes and, and all that. And I think this goes into a lot of broader conversations that uh, we won't have time for tonight, but a lot of broader conversations on customer service and what we really, not, what we really expect out of our families. Um, and I do appreciate, Dr. Tuhir, your your explanation of what went into you know the reasons behind this. and. I know some of it is beyond our control, but I just a good learning point, like you said, in terms of you know this should have been done weeks ahead of time and and trying to get this this process streamlined uh, and what the plan is with um, moving forward with the the consultant and um, advisory group and some other things that will hopefully help improve this process um, right away and and hopefully in, in the years to come. Thank you, Ms. Shaw. Yes. Thank you. 
Just a real brief comment. Um, Dr. Trujillo, I do appreciate um, your candor um, and you know, perhaps to, maybe to some parents who were really upset, it might it sound like excuses, but I appreciate that, that you have been um, upfront with what's going on. And I'll just echo Dr. Ravi. I, my daughter does not take the bus, but I helped um, a family member out with their son on the first day of school because I had, um, I was able to go and pick him up. So um, I, people connect school buses with school. And so um, we just need to make sure it's, you know, everybody's coming back to school for the first time. You know, these, these headaches and, you know, I think keeping up a, an open dialogue with the community about it is, is the best way to go. Absolutely, and I, I want to echo what um, the last two board members said, like we can't keep doing this to our district, to the community, um, to the parents, like, you know, even the board members were, you know, late to hear about this. And I think, you know, that kind of thing is unacceptable. Um, and so I, I hope that moving forward, we just use this as a, you know, the final lesson that we have to take care of business immediately and uh, let let the people know, even if it's an unfortunate thing that's gonna happen, prior knowledge, at least like a week ahead would have um, really helped people. Absolutely. Okay, so moving on to the last item on 9.1 future meeting dates and agenda items. Um, any board members have an item they'd like to add? Um, I'm wondering, Dr. Trujillo, if we could get like an info item um, in the future about um, how the district deals with, uh, you know, ACs breaking down and like how we can um, reduce the time where, um, you know, if a classroom's AC breaks down, how quickly that can get um, resolved. Because I know there's many places around the district who have had broken ACs in their classrooms for a while now. Sometimes it doesn't get taken care of and I hope that we can uh, take care of them quicker moving forward. Yeah, we can certainly add an agenda item on that. Um, upcoming agenda items on our end, uh, August 24th. Uh, we certainly will be back uh, with your COVID-19 responsiveness and readiness update. Uh, any updates on our mitigation strategies. We'll also give you an update on the status of uh, outdoor lunching uh, options like we talked about in the uh, in this, this evening's item, uh, as well as a update on progress with the pool testing with the first wave of schools uh, that we're going to be coordinating over the next few weeks. So that'll be a featured item again for us on uh, August 24th. Sounds good. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Good night.